I stepped outside my cabin, breathing in the crisp mountain air that filled the outskirts of Aspen, Colorado. A flock of birds suddenly erupted from the trees, startling me. I chuckled to myself, thinking it ironic that my getaway from city life could still catch me off guard. My name is Theodore Cornwallis, but people just call me Theo. I worked as an accountant for a major firm in New York until I couldn't take it anymore, the noise, the stress, the monotony of it all. So I decided to take a break and rent this secluded cabin for a month. It was perfect, miles away from the closest neighbor and surrounded by a dense forest. Everything was calm and solitary until one day while hiking through the woods, I stumbled across an animal carcass. How strange it was to find such a brutal scene in this serene environment, flesh torn apart and bones shattered as if it had been savagely crushed by an immense force. As days went by, I encountered more mutilated animals with similar wounds. Each time a feeling of unease grew within me. Even though this was happening in nature's realm, something felt unnatural about those killings. What's going on here? I muttered under my breath during a hike with another camper named Malcolm Gerber I bumped into along the trail. He seemed to be just as perplexed as me and equally concerned about our safety. I've got no idea, Malcolm responded with furrowed brows. I've been camping here for years but never encountered anything like this before. Our conversation continued for some time as we tried to put our heads together to figure out what could be causing these chilling events. Malcolm seemed like an ordinary camper who enjoyed escaping his mundane job selling car parts back in Ohio. Eventually, Malcolm suggested forming a makeshift search party, along with some locals he knew from previous trips, Iris Hawkins and Nathaniel Zimmerman, both skilled hunters familiar with this terrain. They too were growing wary of what was happening. We set out early the next morning, with each of us carrying a firearm, searching for clues, or even possibly the creature responsible for these strange events. As we delved deeper into the forest, my heart raced, but Malcolm's humor kept me from completely succumbing to fear. We discovered another chilling scene a mutilated deer partially hidden beneath a bush. This time something caught my eye a trail of blood leading away into the trees. As we silently followed it, the sinister atmosphere thickened. The thought of our precarious situation kept me on high alert while I gripped my firearm tight. My mind raced between different possibilities. Was it a bear, or maybe even a cougar? but neither offered plausible explanations for the level of brutality inflicted upon these poor creatures. We eventually came across a small clearing where the trail seemingly disappeared. Nathaniel began to inspect an old tree stump when suddenly he gasped and fell backward, his gaze locked onto something obscured by dense foliage above. Warning and terror filled his eyes as he hastily wrestled with his rifle. Shoot it! Shoot it now! Nathaniel screamed in panic. Instinctively we all raised our guns and aimed in the direction he indicated but saw nothing until an enormous set of wings unfurled. Iris shot first, followed by Malcolm and then myself. The sound echoed through the treetops as we unloaded our cartridges blindly into what appeared to be some gigantic winged creature unlike anything I'd ever seen. The creature didn't make a sound but dropped clumsily from its perch and disappeared into the underbrush below. We hesitated for a moment before pursuing it against our better judgment, curiosity and adrenaline keeping us moving forward. That thing was unreal! Iris stammered as we ran after it, leaving behind any pretense at coordinated movement or strategy. The trail became murkier and harder to follow but occasional smatterings of blood confirmed we were on the right path. Soon, though, a new noise intruded upon our ears, tortured cries and growls ringing through the air. 
as if beckoned, we separately began approaching the source of the sounds, no longer thinking as a coherent group but individuals propelled purely by what lay ahead. We continued our pursuit, stumbling across broken branches and disturbed foliage. The cries intensified, indicating that the end may be near. We were no longer hunters. We were survivors in pursuit of an unknown terror. As we approached a clearing, we noticed Malcolm missing from the group. I glanced around and called out, Malcolm! Where are you? No response. Nathaniel and Iris also looked for him, but nothing pointed to his whereabouts. Concern washed over all of us, but we had no time to waste. In that moment, Iris received a call on her cell phone. It's Malcolm! She shouted as she answered the call in a hurry. Through the struggle to keep a signal, Iris put Malcolm on speakerphone to let us all hear his panicked voice. Guys! It got me! I don't know how but it has me in its grasp! He yelled between loud breathing and obvious pain. Where are you? Nathaniel demanded. I don't know. Just, just get help. Malcolm screamed before the lion suddenly went dead. The sound of sirens began to emerge through the forest as authorities arrived nearby, evidently called by nearby witnesses who heard the gunshots earlier. Realizing that now was our chance to call for help, Iris dialed 911 and handed me her phone while continuing to search for Malcolm. As I caught my breath and frantically told the dispatcher about our situation, Nathaniel and Iris urged me forward through the woods. Approaching chaotic scene where several first responders congregated. Our stress levels skyrocketed with every step we took towards them, but time was running out for Malcolm, if it hadn't already. There was seemingly no sign of life until finally one officer pulled out something from behind him. It was an old faded book with a title, Cryptids of the World. A creature on its torn cover had striking resemblance to what we had encountered earlier. The officer said, This book was found in a nearby cabin earlier today. It appears that there have been many reports of various unknown creatures roaming these woods over the years, and this book contains information regarding them. Suddenly, tension erupted from within me as I let out a desperate yell. Malcolm is in danger! If you know something about that creature, tell us how to stop it! The officer hesitated for a moment before flipping through the book until he reached a page full of sketches and notes detailing similar creatures we had witnessed earlier. The entry was labeled, Vrocker, the winged terror of ancient folklore. A chill rushed through all of us as we stood surrounded by officials in the dark forest, reading anything and everything we could from that book to save our friend from the monstrous Vrocker. The sirens grew distant, replaced by an eerie silence as Malcolm's screams echoed through the treetops. We pushed onward together. Nathaniel and Iris frantically searched for a trace of Malcolm's presence while I clung to hope. We never saw it again. Reminiscing about that night never gets easier, especially as we recall Malcolm's final desperate pleas for help. In the end, our ignorance proved deadly for him. But sometimes I long to return to our world before encountering Vrocker a time without fear or death on every page of an old book, without friends stolen by legendary creatures. As life moved on without Malcolm, without answers or resolution, we began paying tribute to him through our efforts in educating others about folklore creatures and promoting safety. There was comfort in knowing we were doing something to preserve his memory, something to help ensure his horrifying fate would not be bestowed upon others who dare venture into those cursed woods. Although we come face to face with grim realities each day through our work, a bond has formed between Nathaniel, Iris, and me, a bond born from a harrowing experience that no words can explain. And as the story of Rocker remained undisclosed, 
we took a silent vow to create awareness and save others from meeting the same doomed fate as Malcolm. But still, there are times when I catch myself thinking of the question that still haunts me in sleepless hours. What was the exact end that my friend Malcolm suffered at the hands, or wings, of the Vrocker? It started as an ordinary hike in the remote Redwood National Park. My name is Leonid Mercer, and I'm a wildlife photographer by profession. Hiking has always been my way to unwind and connect with nature, but that experience forever altered the way I perceive the world. As I walked through the dense undergrowth, I encountered a group of fellow hikers, Javanka Winters, Radoslav Olsen, and Ephraim Kowalczyk. We exchanged pleasantries and decided to stay together since our roots aligned. But little did we know what was lurking within the forest. After hours of traversing challenging terrains, we stumbled upon a mutilated deer carcass. This sight was unnerving for even a well-traveled hiker like me. Extreme caution clouded our minds as we speculated on the predator responsible. Javanka shared her fear of bears being in the area while Radoslav joked that there must be a rogue taxidermist stalking us. Fueled by adrenaline, we decided against calling for help. Our phones had no signal in this remote region anyway, and we couldn't risk staying put and waiting for whoever, or whatever, caused these gruesome scenes to find us. Further down the trail, Ephraim opened up about his youth spent working on his family's farm in Idaho, and how it had prepared him for anything life could throw at him. This revealed our vulnerable side as we all shared some personal stories. Soon after, we noticed a pattern to the dead animals, circles formed by their carcasses in varying places around us. Panic began settling in as we struggled to establish any logic behind these patterns and remembered that this was not territory typically frequented by bears. Our plight reached a disastrous peak when Radoslav suddenly disappeared from sight. He had fallen into a concealed pit dug into the earth designed for trapping unsuspecting creatures. He was still alive but injured, and we quickly towed him out. However, this incident was a clear warning that something sinister was lurking in the forest. Determined to find answers, we stumbled upon something even more terrifying, an ungodly creature with thick, matted fur and limbs resembling sharp claws unlike any animal we had ever seen before. This horrific beast had an almost human-like body structure but no discernible facial features. The creature was eating something and seemed unaware of our presence. Petrified beyond rational thought, we were too scared to move or make any sound. As we held our breaths, the creature suddenly snapped its head in our direction. It had sensed us. After seeing the creature, the idea of calling for help became enticing to all of us. However, we were still without cell service or any other form of communication. Even if undiscovered by the creature, our situation was inescapable. Panicking but trying our best to stay composed, we quickly assessed our situation and decided on a strategy. Distract the creature and make a run to find help. I remembered my father's wisdom from years ago that one day could save my life. Feel the fear but move with purpose and so purposefully I moved. Taking inventory of what little resources I had carried with me, I found a flare gun which would serve as an exceptional distraction tool. The others agreed to trust me with this responsibility. There would be no going back now. As Ephraim tended to Radoslav's injuries and Javanka scoured through her kinesthetic memory for any possible escape routes she may have glanced earlier during our hike. I was quick at setting off the flare gun into the sky directly over the creature's current position. The resulting explosion shocked it into a fit of frenzied panic, precisely as intended. 
My heart raced as anticipation gripped me and the events unfolded at a rapid pace. Amid the confusion, we staggered on and surged forward, abandoning all belongings in a desperate bid to escape. The moments that followed were nothing short of a blur as we ran with the creature relentlessly stalking us. The ground trembled beneath us as we tried our best to fight on. We continued running through the dense forest, branches slapped against our faces, and sharp rocks threatened to trip us at every step. The menacing creature relentlessly pursued, its large limbs thrashing, eyes gleaming with determination. Out of breath and slowing down, Javanka beckoned for us to huddle together. Tears streamed down her face as she whispered, I think I remember a small cabin nearby. We can hide there. Efrain quickly nodded in agreement. Radoslav's injuries were worsening, and it was clear we needed shelter. Without wasting any time, we set off towards the cabin. We spotted the cabin seconds before we thought the creature would overtake us. Its structure was old and weathered, but it would do. We scrambled in and locked the door from the inside. Peering out of dirty windows, we could see the shadow of the creature looming outside like a silent watcher. After seemingly endless hours of waiting, the creature finally retreated into the darkness. As exhausted as we were, we knew that staying in the cabin would only end in more fear. Instead, we decided to search for help. As we crept out of the hiding place, Radoslav stumbled on something half-buried near the cabin's entrance an ancient leather-bound book hugged by decayed newspapers and overgrown foliage. Hesitatingly, he picked it up. Perhaps there was useful information inside. Despite not having an interest in folklore or paranormal events, desperation forced me to open the book. As I flipped through its aged pages, an illustration caught my eye. Our pursuer stared back at me from ink-stained parchment. Surrounding the drawing was a brief description of a mythical creature called a Leposca. This child-sized being had an elongated body with long limbs that allowed it to move swiftly through forests while stalking prey. Ephraim glanced over my shoulder and read out loud the Leposca's vengeful motives. Saints and sinners alike will feel her wrath. Leposka was born of anguish and feeds on fear. He continued reading, and explained that the creature was tied to tragedy. It would latch onto a group or individual during moments of extreme trepidation or despair, hunting them relentlessly until it consumes their terror-stricken minds. We didn't have the time to question or ponder this revelation. We looked at each other and knew we needed to survive. Burying our fears deep within us, we set off once again in search of help. As we walked further away from the cabin, Leposka reached out from the shadows, lunging directly towards Radoslav. Before we could react, her claws left a gash across his face. Blood began to pool beneath him as he slumped down. Javanka screamed for help while Ephraim and I held Radoslav up between us. Stumbling towards an old country road, we finally saw a truck approaching in the distance. The driver saw our state of terror and distress and helped us get Radoslav into the truck bed before racing towards the nearest hospital. As we drove away at breakneck speed, I sobbed for my fallen friend and silently prayed for his survival. The doctor who treated Radoslav informed us he survived but would suffer severe scarring. We shared our unbelievable story with him before leaving heavy-hearted. We never truly forgot that nightmarish ordeal with the Leposka nor let go of the friends we left behind who were victims of this malevolent being. However, life went on for us, surrounded by disbelief and lingering terror lurking in the back of our minds. Although not well versed in folklore or supernatural phenomenon before that fateful event, I vowed one thing, to study these dark legends so none would ever have to suffer like we did.
I had just finished working on my farm out in rural Nevada, and my muscles ached as I pulled my truck up to the gas station. The air was dry and crisp, making me think that that evening would be chilly. My name's Nathaniel Bracken, but everyone calls me Nate. Just a simple man, trying to make ends meet after inheriting the old family farm from my late father. As I filled up my tank, I noticed a man at the tavern across the street stumbling out, clearly intoxicated. Hey, Harv! he shouted. You ain't gonna believe this. There's some sort of animal out in them woods. Harvey Wilkerson was our town sheriff, and he waved off the drunk, saying he'd look into it later. On my drive back to the farm, the road cut through thick woods surrounding my property. I started seeing signs of something amiss. Broken branches scattered on the road and deep gouges in the tree trunks. Some unsettling feeling crept up my spine, but I shook it off and chalked it up to nature taking its course. As I parked in front of the farmhouse, there was a group of locals huddled around Eliza Caulfield's truck. Her husband, Thomas, explained that he'd found mutilated cattle scattered near their property line earlier that day. A knot formed in my stomach hearing the news. The sun had begun setting by then, and an unpleasant orange hue cast shadows over our faces as we discussed what could have possibly caused such carnage. After everyone went their separate ways, I went inside to check on some hunting cameras I'd set up at various points on my property. To my dismay and horror, a huge creature with hunched shoulders and matted fur appeared on several of the screens, far too big to be any known predator in these parts. Its eyes glowed unnaturally in the night vision footage, and suddenly, I couldn't help but think of the drunk man at the gas station. What had he seen? No sooner had I started packing my hunting rifle did the sound of gunshots ring out in the distance. I sprinted to my truck, tires squealing as I took off towards Eliza and Thomas's property. The smell of gasoline and smoke filled my nostrils as their barn came into view, engulfed in flames. Gunshots continued to echo in our little valley, with people firing at thick shadows just beyond the firelight. Desperate to help save the Caulfield's trapped livestock, a few of us managed to break down the barn door and lead some cows and horses out through the smoke. In between their panicked whinnies and bellows, I could hear guttural growls from somewhere further out in the dark woods. Johnson Lyle stumbled backward into my side, barely missing me with a spray of buckshot as he fired at something that lunged towards us from within the flames. The creature's silhouette danced among the roiling smoke before leaping onto a nearby horse with a blood-curdling screech. Not waiting for this monstrous animal to make its next move, we retreated back to my truck as a group. Shoved inside like sardines in a can, we peeled out of there faster than Jesse Owens in his prime, all while trying not to hit anyone running along beside us. In what seemed like ages later, we found ourselves back at my farmhouse only to be greeted by an eerie sight shattered windows and splintered chunks of wood left behind by some unimaginable force only hinted at by deep claw marks on my porch railing. Fear seeping into every fiber of our being, we searched my property with guns drawn until movement from inside one of our chicken coops caught our attention. Johnson kicked open its door, and there it stood, the unholy creature that had been terrorizing us this entire time. Its eyes burned with malice and hunger as it lunged toward Winona Lancaster, managing to tear a hole in her neck before Johnson's shots pierced its side. As it recoiled from Johnson's attack, it flipped an old tractor in its path as if it was made of paper, scattering our group in a panic. The situation escalating with every harrowing moment, I bit down on my fear and aimed my rifle at the charging predator. My finger tightened on the trigger, aiming for the fall creature's head. The shot rang out, cutting through the chaos of people screaming and scrambling to avoid the monstrous being. 
I could see my bullet wound the creature, but it barely slowed down. It continued to maul and attack those who were unable to get out of its way. Johnson yelled for us to retreat, hoping to lead the monster away from our friends and family gathered at my property. As we moved further from the gruesome scene taking place before us, we hoped that our collective sacrifices would not be in vain. The following day, we gathered together again those who survived and tried to figure out what needed to be done. Given our limited knowledge about this predator, we decided that attempting to confront it could only lead to more death and destruction. We needed something or someone with knowledge of folklore creatures. It was then that Henry Morrison arrived at my door. Having been called by a neighbor who somehow heard about our troubles, he came unbidden but welcomed. He had apparently studied myths and legends focusing heavily on identifying fantastical beasts in ancient texts. We listened as Henry explained what he believed our attacker to be. Known as a Vorinthrex, this creature was a rare but terrifyingly powerful being that fed off its victim's blood and fear. The idea sent shivers down our spines as images of last night's carnage reminded us of our defeated friends who could undoubtedly feel their own fear coursing through their veins in the moments just before they died. Henry was steadfast as he detailed everything he knew about this beast, how it was seemingly impossible to kill through conventional means, due not only to its immense size but also its imperviousness to most types of harm inflicted upon it. We knew we had little chance against such an unearthly foe but couldn't allow this monster to plague our community any longer than necessary. With Henry's guidance, we formulated a plan to draw the Vorinthrex away from us and onto the county's parklands, where we hoped it could be dealt with. Our group, once again armed to the teeth but with a clearer understanding of the enemy, set off together. The battered survivors among us held stubborn determination in their eyes, understanding that if we failed today, there might not be another opportunity to act before something more terrible happened. The battle that ensued was swift as we detected the Vorinthrex approaching our position. It came straight for us as if sensing our vulnerability and our collective delusion that we could stand against it. Henry signaled for us to split up as we attempted to draw the creature into our carefully laid trap. Our tactics seemed to work as the Vorinthrex was disoriented by firework displays we set off and the sounds of guns firing all around it. Confused, it stumbled straight into our ambush. We had set up a massive pit lined with sharp stakes at the bottom a crude trap for such an extraordinary beast but Henry insisted that impaling the creature multiple times on these wooden spikes would likely deal enough damage to kill it. The Vorinthrex let out a horrible shriek before falling into the pit. Within moments, its powerful form was rendered immobile by the piercing stakes. Blood poured from its body, mingling with its bitter bile before pooling at the bottom of this makeshift grave. Silent tears fell from those who survived the massacre as they mourned their lost loved ones. We had defeated the Vorinthrex at a great cost to ourselves and our community, but perhaps now we could begin healing and find the strength to rebuild what had been shattered so violently. However, one question remained unanswered. Why did such a rare creature venture forth from legend to terrorize us? Only time will tell if we ever learn what strange event ignited the Vorinthrex's wrath. But for now, with our foe defeated, we turn to rebuilding and remembering the fallen, victims like Winona Lancaster, who may finally rest in peace, knowing that we successfully purged this evil from our world. It all started when I joined a group of friends, including Jackson Fife and Arabella Dracott, for a camping trip in the Big Thicket National Preserve in Texas. We hoped this weekend getaway would relieve the stresses of our mundane work lives. 
Little did we know that it would culminate in something we'd never forget. We pitched our tents and gathered around a crackling fire, sharing stories while feasting on beans and hot dogs. I reminisced about the time my father taught me how to build a fire from scratch, demonstrating the swift flick of the wrist needed for the perfect amount of friction, an invaluable skill that felt especially relevant now. During one of our conversations, Arabella paused and tilted her head toward a distant rustling sound. The foliage shifted as a creature slinked out from the brush, making its way to our campsite. "'What is that?' whispered Jackson, his expression horrified. The creature was unlike anything we had ever seen before. Its elongated limbs ended in sharp claws— and scaly skin covered its grotesquely twisted body. Terror gripped us as it emitted an ethereal, marrow-chilling howl that pierced the silent night. We scrambled to grab our equipment. Jackson seized his camera to document this bizarre encounter, while Arabella grabbed her trusty pocket knife that she'd carried since college. Their fear was unmistakable in their darting eyes and labored breaths. We couldn't call for help as phone reception was completely non-existent in these remote woods. Those around us were miles away, deaf to our unspoken pleas for rescue. But we couldn't just stand by and let this creature possibly harm us or anyone else who ventured into these woods unsuspecting. The creature prowled closer, its stealthy movements betraying an unseen intelligence beneath its monstrous demeanor. Everything about it screamed danger, but curiosity gnawed at us almost as ferociously as our fear. We whispered, plotting to investigate the creature's presence from a distance in the hope of finding some reasonable explanation for its existence. Armed with a little courage and our desperate hope for answers, we decided to follow the unearthly beast once it left the campsite. Slowly and cautiously, we moved through the dense underbrush of the thicket, relying on our ears to track it by sound. The cruel irony of pursuing such a gruesome predator did not escape me. During our pursuit, we stumbled upon a disturbing scene. Bloodied animal carcasses lay haphazardly strewn across a makeshift nest constructed from bones and torn fabric. It was clear that this creature had been here for a while. Muffled voices startled us, drawing our attention to a group of frightened campers who'd also been drawn to this macabre display. We exchanged anxious looks but hesitated to share what could be safely discussed given the dire circumstances. The creature was not far from us. Its throaty growls pummeled the darkness as it continued its gruesome meal. Mustering caution and stealth, I signaled for everyone to move as quietly as possible in order not to draw attention and find cover within the dense vegetation. Jackson nervously quipped about how our humdrum office job seemed infinitely more appealing at that moment, earning a shaky chuckle from everyone despite our mortal predicament. As we inched our way through thorny vines and choking roots, my mind raced with dread and uncertainty. What would we tell others if we survived this night? Would they even believe us? The creature suddenly let out an ear-splitting scream that filled every corner of the woods. Searing pain erupted in my ears while my vision twisted into an ever-narrowing tunnel. Instinct took over as I mustered every ounce of strength towards getting away. Desperation fueled us all as we sprinted our way back to the campsite fully aware that the abomination would be hot on our heels surely. With adrenaline pounding in our veins and breath ragged, we plunged ourselves into the uncertainty that lay before us, hoping against all hope for salvation. It was now a frenzied game of cat and mouse, a life-or-death pursuit through the ever-shifting coursers of tangled foliage. I feared for the lives of my friends— and of the others unwittingly facing this horrendous beast in the darkness. As we reached the edge of the campsite, my heart dropped. Everyone had fled. Apparently, our friends had heard the screams too, and they decided to bail out. Their tents were abandoned and their belongings left behind. 
our chances of survival seemed slim, with the creature closing in. Sam proposed that we keep running and regroup with the rest. Before any of us could object, the beast crashed through the foliage, nails razor sharp, eyes glowing in a deep shade of menacing red. It screeched again, shaking me to my very core. We needed to find help. I whipped out my phone and dialed emergency services, my hands trembling with fear as I held it against my ear. Help us! I frantically screamed into it. There is a creature attacking us. We're at Camp Cypress. Please hurry! Despite still being able to hear the blood-curdling cries of the monster in the background, preparations for an immediate dispatch were underway. My pulse raced faster than ever before. We had little to no time left as we sprinted blindly farther from the beasts but without a plan or direction. Then Jackson spotted an old cabin in the woods, our only potential refuge. We barged into the decaying structure and locked every door leading outside, praying and hoping that this would dissuade or delay our pursuer for rescue to arrive in time. However, it didn't take long for it to come into view, charging straight towards us without mercy, teeth bared, claws slashing through everything that stood between us. But something bizarre happened as soon as it reached the entrance of the cabin. A sudden hesitation loomed over its monstrous expression. It peered around defensively before eventually retreating back into the shadows that once concealed its malicious intentions. Unbeknownst to all of us was an etch on an ancient stone tablet hanging by one of the windows, outlining a folklore creature with a matching description and stance. The name... Mortigo was engraved at the bottom right, and a single word followed. Tilatroff, which I could only guess was a location. As we stood there, relief washing over us, we realized that perhaps we'd have a chance to survive this nightmare. However, the idea of finding the meaning behind the etching quickly vanished when I locked eyes with a lifeless body concealed beneath the rubble of the cabin's spiraling stairway. I felt my gut twist tight in horror. We weren't the first ones here. Several days later, we were rescued by authorities from our newfound haven. The encounter with Mortigo had ended just as quickly as it began. We had survived, but not without scars not only mental but dermal too. We mourn those who were taken by the vicious creature, especially Lisa that unknowingly became its gruesome meal. Memories of her flooded back as we toasted to her memory during the memorial service. Despite having spent most of my life near Tilatroff's woods, Mortigo was a hidden mythical monster whose secret identity remained unknown for centuries. Until then. It seems there are still creatures lurking in the dark corners of forests and regions yet to be discovered. We're fortunate to have made it out alive, but now our world has been cracked open. It's impossible to ignore that there are horrors far beyond what our minds ever thought possible. We don't understand why it attacked or where it came from. Possibly, we never will. Life must go on, but one thing remains certain— no one will ever venture into these woods carelessly again. I always had a knack for getting myself into trouble. If it ain't broke, don't fix it, was something my best friend, Meriwether Hawkins, always liked to say but our curiosity led us on a journey that seemed to defy any sort of logical explanation, and today's trip was no exception. We planned to explore an abandoned farmstead just outside the small town of Welton in Idaho. Passing the gate and broken fence line, I noticed the menacing silhouette of the decaying farmhouse against the cold sky. The wind whispered through the tall grasses, forcing an ominous tune out of them as Meriwether and I slowly approached. A bit of a daredevil by nature, I never shied away from adventure, 
but this felt different, more serious than anything we had previously encountered. Dorn Kennington, Meriwether called out like a child on a playground, stopping midway to examine some strange marks on the ground. Looks like another one got gobbled up by that mystery creature lurking around here. Now he said it in jest, but perhaps there was some truth to be found in his jokester ways. People in town talked about some dangerous animal on the loose terrorizing travelers and livestock alike. Some labeled it imaginary. Others claimed to have heard its horrifying growls in the dark hours before dawn. As we walked through what used to be a thriving farmstead long ago, I recalled my father's stories about working on farms like these when he was younger, planting crops and tending to animals similar to what lived here once. But all that remained now were ruined remains and memories. With each step forward towards the farmhouse door, every nerve ending sparked with anticipation. Merriweather and I ventured inside the dilapidated structure against all common sense. The place bore scars from nature's gradual assault, wooden beams weathered with time and crooked window frames struggling to hold on. We could hear the distant sound of crows while we struggled to make sense of our disgusting find amidst the dirt and debris, a mangled carcass of an unlucky cow, its entrails sprawled out like a grotesque art installation. Feeling nauseous, I kept speculating about what could have done this to the poor beast. A glint in the dim led me towards Meriwether's trembling finger pointing at a terrible thing, deep claw marks on one of the farmhouse's support beams. The same ones we saw outside. Before our imaginations could go wild, there was a loud crash as rotten wood met its demise behind us. Adrenaline coursed through us as we scrambled to find a way out, calling to any deity that would listen for a lifeline. Surely, someone would notice our absence soon enough and come searching. Meriwether tried using his phone, but the reception was practically non-existent in this far-off location. Were we truly alone with an unspeakable horror? We stumbled upon an old cellar door, desperate for escape or refuge from whatever unknown terror lurked nearby. Inside, it was pitch black, and the air felt ten times colder. The walls pulsated with dread as our flimsy flashlight struggled against the darkness. I wish I stayed put with my mama in Memphis, Meriwether whispered cautiously beside me. Me and my fool self just had to follow you into this mess. We had no time for petty bickering. Every second felt heavier under the pressure of our predicament. Closer inspection of the old cellar revealed an array of rusted farm tools hanging ominously on wooden pegs, poor excuses for weapons, and several empty jars giving into decay. Suddenly, gut-wrenching growls echoed from somewhere near the stairs above us, shaking us to our very cores. Our hearts raced, sweat drenching our attempts to be brave. Whatever was responsible for those claw marks was now mere feet away from us. Terrified, we clutched clumsily at the rusty farm tools while that dreadful growling increased in volume and intensity. The ancient cellar filled with dread-laden air as we fumbled to formulate a plan of any kind. In those bleak moments— I wished I could call out for help or provide reassurance and solace to Meriwether, who seemed as unprepared as I was. With shaking hands, Meriwether and I searched for an alternate exit or something to barricade the cellar door. We were cornered by our own fear and the growing presence of the creature hunting us. The growling grew louder and my pulse accelerated. We need to find a way out. Anything. Just anything! I exclaimed as panic gripped my mind. Meriwether nodded in agreement as we searched the dark, cramped confines of our makeshift refuge. I think there's a small window on the far wall, Meriwether said, her voice trembling. We stumbled towards the window on shaky legs. As I struggled to pry it open, the cellar door started to creak under enormous pressure from outside. 
The claw marks engraved in its splintered wood taunted us mercilessly. Time seemed to evaporate with each agonizing second. Finally managing to force the window open, we squeezed through the narrow gap. We dropped onto the cold ground outside and took off running toward our parked car a mile away, equipped with nothing but our old rusty farm tools for protection. As we sprinted against all odds, we saw for the first time what hunted us, a creature standing on two legs over seven feet tall, covered in coarse dark hair with skin stretching over elongated limbs. It bore fangs sharp enough to pierce flesh like paper and emitted a guttural snarl that boiled our blood cold. Against it consumed us both. Call for help! I screamed at Merriweather as we reached our car. My hands were shaking as I fumbled with the keys, but she was catalyzed into action by my words. She dialed frantically while my feeble attempts at starting the car persisted. Moments later she screamed, The signal is too weak! We felt completely helpless in that moment. Our last-ditch effort was to drive away as fast as possible, leaving this nightmare behind. Ignoring my shaking hands, I finally managed to start the car and barrel away into the night. As we drove further from that godforsaken cellar, our hearts pounding in our ears, relief began to wash over us. We had survived, for now at least. Our only option was to return home and figure out what exactly we narrowly escaped. In the safety of our residence, I scoured through local newspapers and history books hoping to discover any information about this terrifying monster. Hours upon hours of research offered no consolation until I stumbled across an old town legend about a creature said to stalk the woods surrounding our town, a ghastly beast who feasted on the flesh of men. It was known as the Gruesome Gnarl a formidable creature that reached unspeakable heights and haunted locals since time immemorial. As I read its ghastly description, chills ran down my spine. The legends matched our experience flawlessly. With each horrifying detail recited by Merriweather over my shoulder, what started as a hushed whisper grew louder and more frantic until it was clear. We'd survived an encounter with the gruesome gnarl. But the question remained, how did this creature from local folklore now terrorize real townsfolk? Were there more of them hiding within the shadows? Whatever the case, we had unknowingly stumbled into something far more sinister than we could have ever imagined. In the days that followed, I couldn't stop thinking about that nightmarish encounter and Merriweather's safety. It became a constant shadow in the back of my mind— uncertain, terrifying, and ever-present. We no longer ventured alone into the wild or near any abandoned places. The knowledge of what lurked within the shadows forced us to rethink every choice made outdoors. We lived our lives in constant fear of rekindling dormant rage and repeating past mistakes. In time, people began to forget, the city breathed again and our story was enveloped in a thick cloud of doubt from disbelievers. But for Merriweather and myself, it remained forevermore seared into our souls. I would give anything to return to that moment when we discovered the cellar door, anything to avoid opening it and unleashing the horrors within. The gruesome now would live on forever. I remember chuckling at a silly joke my friend Jared Gibson had shared with me during our road trip through the Appalachian Mountains. The sky was painted with hues of orange and pink as the sun dipped behind the peaks. We were heading to a cabin, a spontaneous retreat from our mundane city lives. The narrow winding road took us deeper into the remote woods, only accompanied by the distant chirping of crickets. Jared fiddled with the radio, trying to catch a signal but nothing but static filled the air. With just over seventy miles to our destination, we knew it was going to be a long drive. 
My name's Eric Weissman, and I'm a freelance photographer. I've always been drawn to untouched landscapes where I could document nature's beauty in its truest form, unblemished by civilization. Jared, on the other hand, had a fascination for unsolved mysteries that lurked in hidden corners of the world. Driving along that desolate road, we stumbled upon the dying embers of a campfire, which piqued our curiosity. Veering off track, we decided to take a closer look. A foul stench assaulted our nostrils as we approached what seemed like the remains of an animal carcass. An unnerving silence enveloped us as we noticed claw marks on nearby trees and signs of struggle. We exchanged uneasy glances and hurried back to our car but couldn't shake off the unease that something was lurking just out of sight. As darkness seeped into the forest, absorbing every last ray of light, we continued forward. At last, we reached our cabin and locked up tight for some comfort in an isolated area where phone reception or help felt like a distant dream. Over dinner that night, we debated between ourselves about what could have mauled that poor animal earlier. We decided it must have been some feral mountain beasts preying on weaker creatures. Nevertheless, there was a nagging feeling that it was something more sinister. The following morning, we ventured into the woods to hike but found ourselves surrounded by an eerie quietness. The buzzing cacophony of life had gone mute, and a sense of foreboding gripped us with each step. As we followed a trail further away from the cabin, we stumbled upon more gruesome evidence— torn animal carcasses, and what appeared to be deep gashes on tree trunks. It dawned on us that whatever creature roamed these woods was not only relentless but intelligent enough to mark its territory. We felt an escalating sense of dread clawing at our minds, urging us to flee back to safety. Whispering delirious theories about what could be stalking us, we reached the cabin only to find it tampered with. The doors were hanging loosely off their hinges, and an acrid odor permeated the air. An indescribable feeling coursed through our veins as we realized this was no mere encounter with wildlife. Our hearts thudded in unison as we decided to arm ourselves with whatever improvised weapons we could find and search for a place to hide where the creature couldn't reach us. Weaving through the darkness— the need for survival drowned out our reluctance to confront this unknown terror. A guttural growl echoed from afar as if signaling the inevitable confrontation. Our pulse raced faster as we readied ourselves, two creatures of different worlds colliding in a brutal primal dance governed by pure instinct. Sweat trickled down our brows, our breaths grew shallow and rapid. In that darkest hour, when every inch of hope seemed lost between life and death lies a thin line marked by a single decision, fight or flight? But even in that haunted space where fear constricted every thought, I astonished myself with the will to live. I bolted the cabin door with a makeshift barricade and urged my companions to find anything that could be used as a weapon. Panicked, we scoured the area, collecting branches, rocks, and other items that could at least provide us with some sense of security. The guttural growl grew closer, and it was almost tangible how utterly suffocating the atmosphere had become. No one spoke. The only sounds heard were the pounding of our hearts and rapid breaths. Our thoughts raced to find a solution or an escape route. One of my companions, Mark, suggested we split up. If the creature could only follow one group, the others might get away and call for help. I didn't like the idea, but it seemed our only hope left in this dire situation. We divided ourselves into two groups. Mark led one group towards the back of the cabin, while I stayed put with Lucy and James. As I watched Mark's group disappear into the darkness, I hoped that their sacrifice wouldn't be in vain. Suddenly, a blood-curdling scream pierced through the otherwise silent night air. It was Christine from Mark's group, her cry echoing through our very beings. 
We knew we had to act quickly if we were to have any chance of surviving this nightmare. Recklessly driven by surging adrenaline and terror, Lucy picked up an axe from a nearby woodpile. Her eyes now glazed over with determination as if she had resolved herself to endure what was to come. Before we could turn and run, however, we spotted it, the creature that had been plaguing us all this time. Standing at an unnatural height on wiry appendages coated in dark fur that seemed to absorb what little light surrounded it. Its face was twisted into a snarl revealing rows of serrated teeth as it hunched over Christine's lifeless body, clearly its latest prize. Without thinking or uttering a word, we attacked. I hurled rocks at the monstrosity while James and Lucy approached it with makeshift weapons. The creature growled and turned to us, displaying an eerie intelligence in its eyes, as if the hunt had now become even more intriguing to it. But we didn't have time to dwell on this. While distracting it from a distance, James and Lucy sprinted toward a nearby road, hoping to flag down a passing car or find someone that could help us. The creature hesitated between pursuing Mark's group or going after us but ultimately chose its latest prey. As our monstrous stalker bounded after James and Lucy, I followed close behind, praying to reach any semblance of safety first. Once we reached the road, we were astonishingly fortunate to find an elderly couple traveling by car who took one look at our disheveled appearances and offered assistance immediately. Hours later, after speaking with local law enforcement, we discovered stories regarding strange occurrences in these woods, attacks on people and animals alike that had never been solved. The sheriff finally disclosed that these incidents were rumored to be caused by an ancient creature from local folklore, the Scarvin. It was a horrendous beast known for terrorizing the area in times long past before seemingly vanishing into urban myth. Shocked and weary, we couldn't believe our nightmare had been rooted in such legends. As news spread throughout the town of our harrowing experience, it became clear that the Scarven was no longer just folklore. It was alive and terrifyingly real. Overwhelmed with grief over Christine's untimely death and our near brush with mortality, we knew we had no choice other than honoring those lost by working with locals to ensure that something like this would not happen again. Together, with the support of the community and law enforcement, we began developing strategies to track the Scarven and protect the area from any further attacks. Though the horrors of that night will never fade, we will always remember our dear friend and the horrific ordeal that revealed to us, in reality, the line between folklore and fact may not always be clear. I remember turning onto the remote dirt road, leading to a secluded cabin in the dense forests of Oregon, eagerly anticipating a weekend getaway with my friends. My name's Edgar Sutcliffe and I work as a database administrator, a mundane job that I'm sure resonates with a lot of people. Upon arriving, we all introduced ourselves. My friends, Felicia Crenshaw, Wallace Yarbrough, and Gertrude Mullen, were excited for some outdoor adventures and quality time together. Our first day was uneventful, filled with hiking, laughter, and great food. We bonded over our shared experiences of surviving adulthood in an ever-changing world. The next morning, we discovered a disturbing sight, an animal carcass barely recognizable after being brutally disfigured. We speculated about bears or mountain lions but couldn't shake the feeling that something else was lurking out there. Feeling uneasy but trying to remain calm, we went back to enjoying our trip. As night fell, we gathered around the campfire. Felicia suggested roasting marshmallows for esmores while Wallace regaled us with tales of his childhood camping adventures. Suddenly we heard rustling noises from the woods beyond and saw branches snapping mere feet from us. 
Did you guys hear that? Gertrude whispered. We collectively decided not to dwell on the eerie atmosphere and instead chatted away late into the night. However, noises from deep within the forest persisted. Worse yet, they progressively encroached on our little hideout. The following day was colder than before. Shrugging off those unsettling sounds and thoughts of asking for help, we ventured deeper into the woods for a much-awaited hike. Felicia mentioned her struggles with opening up to new relationships while I attempted to lighten the mood with some jokes. Amidst my story about an awkward encounter at a grocery store, Gertrude let out a gasp as she stumbled upon yet another gruesome scene. A mutilated deer laid lifeless, flayed beyond recognition. Panic was evident in our eyes, but fear of appearing paranoid kept us from expressing our dread at what was happening in the woods around us. We silently agreed to return to the cabin. As dusk approached, the feeling of being watched intensified. Fear was consuming us like a smoldering fire. The tension crackled in the air, suffocating any attempts at humor or casual conversation. The sun dipped below the horizon, plunging the world into darkness. The members of our group were now more cagey and concerning behaviors emerged from our compatriots. Some even argued about whether it was wise to leave earlier than anticipated in case something unimaginable was lurking around. Some disagreed vehemently, for fear of admitting defeat against a menace that might be imaginary. Just as we reached a tentative decision to stay put and call for help in the morning, an unholy roar shattered any semblance of calm as every last shred of hope evaporated into acrid smoke. Breaking through the forest's edge was a creature most foul, a beast towering over us with sinewy muscle-ridden limbs, poised for violence. Its visage was unlike anything we'd ever witnessed, vaguely humanoid with animalistic features, covered in thick matted fur that glistened with an ominous sheen, gleaming under the moonlight. Its claws were razor-sharp and hooked like a predator's talons, and its powerful jaw opened wide to reveal rows of serrated teeth capable of tearing flesh and bone. Wallace reacted first, grabbing a makeshift weapon, a heavy iron skillet abandoned after dinner preparations, and lunged at the monstrosity with a primal scream that shook us all to our core. Felicia scrambled for her cell phone as Gertrude screamed for reinforcements from local authorities. Please drowned out by blood-curdling shrieks radiating from the battle between man and monster. As Wallace struck the creature, it roared furiously, unfazed by the brutal impact. The terrifying scene unfolded before my eyes, my friend fighting for his life and our safety against an adversary from our nightmares. Amidst the chaos, fear knotted in my gut like a heavy chain, dragging me deeper into despair. My heart pounded in my chest as I tried to think of a way to help Wallace without getting myself killed. Felicia managed to dial 911 and reported the attack as I frantically searched for anything that could serve as a weapon. Wallace was weakening under the relentless assault of the creature, but he was buying us time. A sharp cracking sound made me turn in horror the creature had managed to break Wallace's arm. Evading the creature's grasp, he quickly retreated back towards us, blood streaming down his bruised face. The sound of distant sirens announced the arrival of the police. The creature suddenly tensed and glanced towards the wailing noise. Seizing this momentary distraction, Gertrude handed me her pepper spray. It wasn't much, but it was better than nothing. As the police arrived on the scene, Guns drawn and aimed at the fearsome beast, they quickly assessed the situation. One officer shouted orders while others attempted to coax people out of harm's way. I noticed a metal pole lying nearby and picked it up, edging closer to Wallace while avoiding the monster's line of sight. With a sudden surge of adrenaline, I charged at it swinging with all my remaining strength, landing a devastating blow on its skull. 
It staggered but did not fall. Instead, it roared once more in an earth-shattering display of fury, violently screaming in defiance. Cornered like a wounded animal, it leaped at me with terrifying speed while its hot breath singed my face holding its jaw wide open revealing those bone-chilling teeth once more. Acting on pure instinct, I jabbed the metal pole into its mouth with all my might. The muffled shriek emanating from its throat was drowned out by police gunfire lighting up the dark clearing like fireworks. Unable to withstand this combined assault any longer, the monster succumbed and collapsed onto its back motionlessly oozing dark thick blood. With the creature's defeat came an overwhelming sense of relief that washed over me. Wallace was being tended to by paramedics while the police were securing the area and inspecting the now-dead creature. An animal control expert who had arrived at the scene approached me cautiously. "'Have you ever seen anything like this?' he whispered, casting a disbelieving gaze upon the slain opponent. I shook my head, still unable to guess what horror we had just confronted despite its death. Only after some days of recovering from the shock was I given information from a local history expert about a creature called Cachotel, which matched the description of our antagonist. The Cachotel was said to be a dangerous beast often found in deep forests, with legends surrounding it dating back centuries. The folk tales described it as having formidable strength and a human-like intelligence mixed with predatory instincts. Hardly anyone believed these stories to be true, dismissing them as ancient fantasies meant to scare children, until that fateful night when we experienced them firsthand. Its violent intrusion into our lives left us all traumatized and forever thankful for the authorities who quickly intervened. In the end, we learned that not all legends should be forgotten. Some are destined to rise from obscurity haunting reality and becoming living nightmares. We will never forget that dreadful encounter with the Kachwitao as long as we live, for it reminded us how fragile and fleeting our lives can be amidst forces greater than ourselves. I woke up with a start feeling an uneasy knot in my stomach like I hadn't experienced before. This was my first camping trip alone, which might have been what caused my edginess. Just another chance to prove my friends wrong about how capable I was in the wilderness. My name is Jasper Finnegan, by the way, and I'm an ordinary guy who just moved to Oregon from a bustling city. That's probably why I had such intense anxiety about the whole ordeal. The serene beauty of Crater Lake National Park surrounded me. The deep blue waters shimmered in the sunlight, calmed by the gentle embrace of cliffs and trees. As I sipped my coffee, wondering why people wandered into the dense wilderness without even flinching, a couple approached my campsite. Hey there! The man shouted amiably. My name's Silas Whitlock, and this is my wife, Ophelia. Nice to meet you, his wife added politely as we exchanged flustered greetings. We engaged in small talk, sharing our reasons for coming to this remote corner of America. They were long-time nature enthusiasts and were equally intrigued by the mysteries that the wilderness held. As darkness fell that night, I cozied up by the warm campfire with Silas, Ophelia, and a few other newly acquainted campers. Our conversations were light-hearted and filled with laughter until something changed. A guttural growl echoed through the trees nearby, something none of us had ever heard before. Unsettled but tense with curiosity, we searched for the source of the noise using flashlights but found nothing. Time seemed to slow down as we methodically patrolled around our tents in a routine search for danger. It ate away at me. What if this creature has observed us the whole day? As I observed empty cans and food wrappers scattered about our campsite, the thought dawned that we might have invited it ourselves. 
It wasn't our campsite to begin with. The wilderness had claimed it long before we arrived. As we scanned, I stumbled across a shocking sight. A carcass lay half-eaten upon the cold dirt, its entrails spilled out in a grotesque pattern. The sight forced a rising lump in my throat. Furious and terrified, we gathered around the campfire in shock. We all agreed we needed help immediately, but realized how impossible it was to get any signal at this location. We collectively decided to flee back towards civilization. I couldn't shake the feeling that something was following us regardless of where we went or how fast our pace was. Its sinister presence lurked in silence but unfailingly to my side. As I frantically filled two jerry cans at an isolated water pump near midnight, sounds of movement brushed closer in the darkness. Mustering my courage and gripping a rifle tightly, I whirled around, only to meet face to face with a humanoid figure, muscular and clad in jet black fur. Its claws clenched tightly by its sides, crimson smears staining them up to its grotesquely elongated jaw filled with razor-sharp teeth. It lunged forward. I squeezed the trigger, and missed, matching the creature's speed stroke for stroke as it scurried on all fours towards Silas and Ophelia's tent far too easily for comfort. The abomination was silent as a specter while it crouched over their sleeping forms. Their violent awakening was like echoes from another world. Silas fought back valiantly, his knife flashing through the air only to be batted aside by powerful limbs that sent him sprawling across the ground, followed by Ophelia's chilling screams that pierced the night air like razors. In unadulterated panic, we raced towards each other in a frenetic attempt to bolster our defenses and repel the monstrous presence. The creature turned from its prey confusion washing over its fierce visage before it pounced towards me without hesitation. As feet pounded along the dirt path after me, every instinct screamed at me to run but my legs refused to oblige. The looming figure in the darkness breathed heavily onto my neck as I stumbled forward in terror when suddenly Ophelia slammed into us both, buying me precious seconds with her brave sacrifice to the maw of death. As Ophelia collided with the creature, I stumbled and hit the ground, my limbs shaking as fear coursed through me. Gasping for air, I managed to get back on my feet while Silas joined me, our eyes locked on the horrifying sight unfolding before us. With furry black arms and legs capable of ripping apart its victims, it seemed more an abomination than a natural being. Silas shouted urgently, we need to get help now. In agreement, I turned to run toward the nearest campground where we knew other campers were staying. My heart pounded wildly as I sprinted away from the gut-wrenching sounds of the creature attacking Ophelia. Silas followed closely behind, both of us focused solely on reaching the strangers that could be our only hope for survival. Bursting into the camping area, I spotted a family of four huddled around a roaring fire. Covered in sweat and panting heavily, I struggled to put together coherent words to warn them of the terror heading our way. Creature, attacked! Help us! The father looked up with concern, asking others nearby if they had any idea what was happening. As more campers came over upon hearing our distress, Silas and I explained our situation and urged them to call for reinforcements. Someone managed to make a call to local authorities while others formed groups armed with makeshift weapons such as tent stakes and rocks. Moments later, we heard sirens blaring in the distance. Reinforcements were on their way. With organized groups taking their positions around the area, we waited anxiously for the creature to emerge. Sweat drenched our clothes as our hands trembled with fear. We had no idea if Ophelia was alive or dead but were too terrified to venture back towards the source of her screams. Suddenly, a bloodied figure emerged from the woods. It was Ophelia. She wore a fierce expression, 
although her body was covered in deep claw marks. With a collective gasp, everyone rushed to her aid and began tending her wounds as best they could. The sirens grew louder, and red and blue lights illuminated the campground. Armed officers filed out of several vehicles, alert and ready for action. Once briefed on the situation, they moved towards our initial campsite with extreme caution. We held our breaths, watching the scene unfold from a safe distance. Several tense minutes passed before an officer approached us with a solemn expression. He informed us that they had found parts of the creature scattered over the carnage-stricken campsite. The officers theorized that it must have been fatally injured during its fight with Ophelia, and the remaining pieces appeared to be human. Stunned by this revelation, we exchanged confused glances amongst ourselves and the other campers. Was it possible that the creature was just a mutated person? Or was it some kind of folklore monster no one had ever heard of before? Ophelia's condition stabilized in an ambulance as she received emergency treatment for her injuries. She would likely survive but forever bear the scars of her terrifying encounter. The days following our nightmarish experience were filled with investigations, interviews, and news broadcasts. Piecing together information from various sources, we discovered that the creature once had been a man, but had attained horrific qualities through illegal experimentation conducted by an underground organization. Silas couldn't help but shudder upon hearing this twisted origin story. What a nightmare! That poor man transformed into such a beast. Though burdened by their ordeal, those who had lived through it found solace in each other, especially Silas and me. As time went on and life started to return to normalcy, we remained vigilant survivors who would never forget Ophelia's bravery or the monstrous creature that ripped apart our lives during those brief, terrifying days in the wilderness. I remember the morning clearly, as I wandered through the woods with my trusty camera in hand. The sun was shining, casting a beautiful glow through the tall redwood trees. I'm Asa Hutchinson, freelance photographer and nature enthusiast. My love for photography had led me to many remote destinations, but nothing could have prepared me for what happened that day. I was in Northern California's Redwood National Park, a seemingly peaceful and serene location. With every step that I took, small rocks and twigs crackled underfoot while red-winged blackbirds sang cheerfully. Through each generation, people like me have roamed these quiet forests to capture images and memories of the natural world around them. As I found a perfect spot to snap some photos of the sunlight dappling against a blooming rhododendron bush, I overheard two other hikers talking about some kind of monster in a hushed tone. They described it as a large creature covered in thick fur with enormous claws and teeth. My antennae sprang up in curiosity. Sure enough, these presumably wild tales were nothing more than urban legends traveling from park visitor to park visitor. As I continued my trek toward the scattered picnic area, my thoughts revolved around that strange conversation. In my skepticism, I chuckled because now it felt like those scary stories were part of folklore or even our cultural heritage. Feeling peckish after reaching the picnic area, I unpacked my lunch onto one of the empty benches when loud shouts came from within the forest. Help! Somebody help! Two park rangers rushed into the wooded area with fearful expressions plastered all over their faces. This wasn't acting. A man named Lee Thatcher said he was nearly attacked by this so-called creature. As much as they searched high and low for any traces or clues, they found no sign of whatever nearly attacked Lee. As panic began to envelop the group, the rangers enlisted the help of a few hikers, me included, 
to aid in their search for the creature. We branched out into the dense woods and delved deeper into the forest than any navigation device could guide us. As we moved inward, a large rock face loomed over a wide clearing. Ancient and overgrown, the inscriptions and artwork plastered across its face looked like they predated most American settler history. At first glance, nothing seemed out of the ordinary as we approached the rock formation. Suddenly, I caught a glimpse of unusual claw marks visible on one side of the ruin. An oddity indeed, but not reason enough to jump to supernatural conclusions. However, as we continued forward, it became apparent that something strange was occurring. Animal cries filled the air as our party ventured deeper into a ravine. I couldn't shake off a looming yet unexplainable sense of dread creeping up my spine. We stumbled upon bones of various creatures littering the forest floor and covering it in spots with their once bloody remains. It appeared as though these poor animals were mauled ferociously by something far stronger than themselves. As we picked our way through an area filled with bones and fur, we suddenly heard more desperate cries from ahead within even denser undergrowth, shouting for help. We hurried towards those pleas when out of nowhere, it appeared, a fearsome beast covered in thick fur from head to toe. Its feral eyes glared menacingly at us with an unquenchable hunger for blood. The teeth that filled its monolithic maw seemed like they could tear through solid steel, while its claws could only be described as deadly daggers protruding from its hulking mass. An elderly man named Gerald Meeks was pinned beneath one gigantic paw. He was bleeding heavily from numerous claw marks across his body but still conscious enough to tell us what happened. I tried to escape, but it caught up to me. I couldn't defend myself. Looking around in horror-stricken realization, we now understood that this wild predator, sensing easy prey nearby, had been waiting for someone desperate enough like Gerald. As the creature stood over Gerald, ready to devour him, our small group of survivors tried to figure out how it could be stopped. Did we have enough firepower? What would drive this terrifying beast away from the trapped man beneath its massive paw? The answer eluded as panic seized us all. We looked at each other, our faces etched with fear. We knew that running was futile, that monstrous creature would easily outrun us. But standing there, doing nothing, was not an option either. I glanced at the others and shouted, Get to higher ground! I'll distract it. I picked up a large rock and threw it at the beast. It turned its attention to me as the rock bounced off its hide. My companions scrambled up the incline we were on. However, Gerald had lost too much blood and couldn't move quickly enough. I yelled for help from our group, hoping they might have an idea or two on how to save him. Jack was quick to respond shouting back at me with urgency. There's a hunter's hut nearby. Let's get Gerald there. I nodded and rushed to Gerald's side while Jack supported him on his other side. Together, we lifted him as best we could and made our way toward the hut Jack mentioned. The creature lunged in our direction, but I tossed another rock at it, causing a brief moment of distraction. As we drew closer to the hut, we spotted a figure standing in the doorway, an old woman who appeared unfazed by the approaching danger. Hurry! she called out, motioning us inside. We managed to drag Gerald inside just as the beast reached the entrance of the hut. The old woman slammed the door shut and secured it with a bar meant for that very purpose. I turned to her in disbelief realizing that this must have been her home for some time now. How did you survive here? This creature has been terrorizing us since we entered this area. The old woman replied calmly. That creature is known as Jikininki in local folklore, said to feast upon human flesh. At my stunned expression, she explained further. 
I've lived here for years undetected by Jikininki because I've learned to mask my scent from him. She silently helped us tend to Gerald's wounds, expertly applying bandages and offering a glass of water. I couldn't help but marvel at her knowledge and composure amidst such chaos. In the meantime, Jack placed a phone call to the nearest rescue center while the rest of our group entered the hut after evading the persistent creature outside. We spent hours inside the hovel, listening to the relentless scratching and growls as the Jikininki attempted to break in. The old woman lit lamps around the hut, providing some warmth in the dimly lit space. She suggested that we sleep in shifts— preparing ourselves for another onslaught when daylight came. As morning broke, we found that Chikininki had retreated into the shadows of the forest. We took this opportunity to pack up and leave as quickly as possible, while the old woman opted to remain in her home that she had successfully protected all these years. With heavy hearts, we carried Gerald on an improvised stretcher, and made our way back towards civilization where immediate medical attention was sought for him. Massively grateful for our chance encounter with that mysterious knowledgeable old woman, we knew that without her assistance, Gerald would not have made it out alive. As we moved further away from that dreaded area and reported our encounter with Jikininki to local authorities, we remembered those who had fallen victim to its brutal attacks. We vowed never to forget their names or faces. Their memory would drive our commitment to spreading awareness about this ghastly creature and encouraging others to avoid its territory. Unimaginable horrors lurk within nature's beauty. Our experiences with Jikininki were proof positive of that chilling truth. And yet, through teamwork, determination, and an unexpected ally in that old woman— we managed not only to survive but also to ensure such terrors didn't claim more lives. The shadows of the forest and the terrifying nights couldn't defeat us, and those memories will stay with us forever, a haunting reminder that safety can never be guaranteed, and vigilance is paramount. I found myself on the outskirts of Archer City, Texas, adjusting to life in the dusty, near-desert terrain after years of city living. I landed the new job at the local power plant and was adjusting nicely. My name is Arthur Kowalski, a 28-year-old with a degree in engineering and a passion for the natural world. The job was a perfect fit. I could make money while working outdoors but had no idea the horrors that lurked in this seemingly unremarkable town. Work colleagues were few and far between, but I befriended one called Matteo Rossi, who also had a penchant for exploring remote areas. One weekend, we headed out to discover the lesser-known trails surrounding Archer City. Armed with maps and GPS devices, we eagerly trekked into the untouched wilderness. Deep into our hike, we came across a small building nestled among the trees, an abandoned lodge. Intrigued by its history and isolation, we decided to explore further. As we approached it, something caught my eye. Blood splatters on one of the windows obscured by thick layers of dirt. My skepticism was palpable, but Mateo shrugged it off, as evidence of some wild animal's hunt gone awry. Venturing inside cautiously, we found decaying furniture and piles of long-forgotten belongings scattered about, abandoned abruptly as if something interrupted whatever had been happening. Suddenly, a rancid stench washed over us as we opened what appeared to be a storage room door. The grisly scene before us was stomach-churning. Dozens of half-eaten carcasses littered the floor. Fear coursed through us both, but morbid curiosity propelled us further into this macabre setting. We came upon several more mauled bodies, each more gruesome than the last torn limbs festering with maggots emanated horror that tortured our senses. Tentatively stepping outside to catch our breath, 
we heard rustling in the underbrush. Moments later, an ear-piercing screech echoed through the air, so unnerving that it made Mateo scream in desperation. What the hell was that? I didn't have a rational answer for him. We hurried deeper into the thick woods, without destination or purpose, driven by fear of what we'd seen and heard. The creature followed us with unnerving speed and agility. Every time we thought we had outrun it, another horrifying screech would reach our ears. Our exhaustion reaching its peak, Mateo collapsed, unable to continue. I dragged him behind a massive tree, praying it would be enough shelter from our relentless pursuer. As I tried to catch my breath and think of a plan, something pounced on us with surprising force. We found ourselves face to face with the monstrous predator that had been hunting us relentlessly. It stood tall on two legs like a deformed human with unnaturally elongated limbs covered in coarse fur. Its head resembled a twisted combination of a wolf and a bear with rows of razor-sharp teeth shimmering in a grotesque grin. Glowing red eyes burrowed into our very souls whilst an acrid musk emanated from its heaving body. Paralyzed with fear, Mateo could do nothing as the creature lunged at him first. The gruesome sight of my friend being mauled was unbearable, snapping me out of my stupor just enough to remember one thing, my handgun. I always carried it for emergencies given the remote locations I worked in but hardly considered actually using it until now. Desperately fumbling to load it while trying to remain hidden, I prayed to land even just one shot for Mateo's sake. I mustered the strength to aim my handgun at the grotesque creature, feeling the sweat covering my shaking hands. I pulled the trigger, and with an ear-splitting bang, I fired a shot towards its body. The bullet struck it, and it recoiled, startled by the sudden pain. It retreated a few steps but quickly resumed its deadly assault on Mateo. I fired again and again, causing it to hesitate in moments of agony. But my aim was far from perfect, and I had no time to worry about that now. Frantically, I yelled at Mateo to crawl towards me as I continued shooting. Mateo! Crawl this way! Move! I shouted as he snapped back into reality, and started inching away from the advancing creature. As Mateo made his way towards me, we both knew that calling for help would be pointless so deep in the woods, where none could reach us in time. Moreover, we had lost our communication devices amidst the chaos, leaving us with little choice but to rely on each other. Once Mateo reached me, I grabbed him by the arm and we started running again. We knew we couldn't outpace such a monstrous predator for long. But if this horrible creature was known by others, if anyone had written or spoken about it, there had to be a way to escape alive. After several minutes of sprinting through the forest with no sign of pursuit, we stumbled upon a cabin with smoke billowing from its chimney. We banged on the door in sheer desperation, hoping whoever was inside could provide some assistance against our seemingly invulnerable enemy. An old man answered the door, his face lined with wrinkles and concern. He looked at our disheveled appearances before ushering us inside without hesitation. As we collapsed onto chairs in his living room, he listened intently as I recounted our terrifying ordeal. Upon hearing our story, he furrowed his brow and shook his head in disbelief. I've heard of a creature like that one. People say it's called a Ruguru. I thought it was just a local legend, but your encounter seems all too real, he said gravely. To our surprise, the old man explained that the Ruguru was indeed known among certain circles for its horrifying appearance and vicious attacks on humans, though many dismissed it as pure folklore. He shared that he had some knowledge about the creature and how to defeat it. The secret, he said, was fire, one of the only elements this abominable Ruguru feared above all else. 
He urged us to gather torches or any form of fire starter in case the creature tracked us down once again. If we couldn't find an immediate solution, using fire as both a weapon and protective shield would be our best chance at survival. Armed with this newfound information, we thanked the old man and prepared ourselves for the inevitable confrontation with our nightmarish pursuer. Whether by sheer luck or gut instinct, Mateo found us several road flares stashed away in a cabinet. We each carried a flare along with backup supplies, flint and steel, to initiate fires when necessary. Construction work often demanded long hours and remote locations void of contact with anyone. We never imagined we'd encounter such a sinister threat lurking in these woods, yet now equipped with some semblance of self-defense, we felt more prepared to escape this living nightmare. We set out again, desperately hoping to reach safety before the sun disappeared behind the horizon, for if we had learned one thing about this horrendous creature called Ruguru, that darkness only fueled its brutal savagery. And so we walked, two men carrying torches into uncertainty, their worlds forever changed by their harrowing experience with the folktale come to life. What lay ahead was unknown, but with each step forward, we inched closer to survival or, perhaps, discovering a way to eradicate the rigor that had relentlessly hunted us. I stumbled upon an unusual newspaper article as I was browsing through the local publication. My name is Arnold Hasbrook, a simple mechanic from Vermont. My life was nothing out of the ordinary until that moment when I saw the headline about some obscure remote American town, at the edge of civilization and national parks. As luck would have it, I was heading there in a few days to visit my cousin Kristen, who moved to that place after marrying a local cop named Randy Zimmer. It took me four bus rides and a long walk before I finally reached the small town. The moment I stepped into this place, everything fell off. A certain strange feeling enveloped me. Yet residents went about with their day-to-day -day activities like everything was normal. It didn't take long for me to notice that everybody seemed to keep her distance from Kristen's house. Kristen hugged me tightly when we met. Arnold, it's great to see you, but you've picked a bad time, she whispered, her eyes brimming with concern. Once inside their home, she revealed that something sinister had been happening in their town. As Randy arrived from work wherein he looked incredibly exhausted and disturbed, he began to explain the events taking place for the last few weeks. A creature, none knew anything about its origins, had been terrorizing their town, kidnapping people from their homes and leaving mutilated bodies scattered through surrounding forests. One day, during my stay with Kristen and Randy, we heard a terrible commotion from the sheriff's station just down the street. The creature attacked again. Curiosity got the best of me as I followed Randy without him knowing. Blood residue covered the walls. Three officers lay on the ground, gasping for breath and trying to explain what they had seen as they clutched at their wounds, exactly as described by previous attacks. Randy gathered the remaining able-bodied officers to form a search party. I couldn't leave him in such a dire situation. I grabbed a hunting rifle from the armory and joined them. The sun began to set when we found ourselves deep into the dense forest that bore evidence of the creature's attacks. Suddenly, we heard a blood-curdling scream coming from somewhere nearby. One of our guys was missing. I couldn't fathom how something could make one man disappear so quickly and quietly. That thing was just beyond my comprehension. Our search continued through the forest as night rapidly approached, when we finally saw it. A beast, the likes of which I had never seen before, towered above us all, standing on two legs and covered in tattered fur. Its grotesque features rendered me momentarily speechless. 
As a group, we opened fire, but it seemed to have no effect on the creature. It lunged at one of our officers, ripping through his flesh with unbelievable ease. Panic surged through the entire search party, and instinctively, we scattered in various directions. I stood my ground, adrenaline surging through my veins. Randy shot another round at the monster while shouting orders through his radio for backup. Soon after, Officer Grady appeared from my left wielding an improvised flamethrower that momentarily held off the creature before it knocked him away into nearby bushes. Randy knelt beside Grady as the creature snarled. In this momentary pause, I thought about what made me stay behind while others fled or avoided danger altogether. It struck me. I never truly cherished how mundane life had been until now. I could see the fear in Randy's face as he tried to keep Grady conscious. I quickly searched for anything that could help us figure out what this beast was and how we could possibly defeat it. The protocols from the police department never prepared us for something like this. We need to find a way to contain or kill it. I shouted, but Randy seemed lost. I don't know, he replied, trying to calm his wounded colleague. Randy's radio suddenly broke the silence with an eerie, distorted voice requesting our location. He responded and asked for backup immediately, adding that something inexplicable attacked us. We weren't certain anyone would believe us until they saw the creature themselves. What seemed like an eternity later, reinforcements arrived with guns drawn as we explained the current situation to our captain who appeared skeptical but willing to help, realizing our desperation. My captain ordered everyone except Grady, who was taken away in an ambulance, to search the surrounding area for any trace of the creature. Randy and I continued our hunt along a narrow path when we stumbled upon a cave hidden behind trees that would make an optimal hideout for any predator. Nervous but ready for a confrontation, we ventured inside with flashlights illuminating our surroundings. The dismal cave smelled of decay. As we treaded carefully through the dark passages populated with gnawed-on animal carcasses and claw marks etched into walls that indicated we were going in the right direction, Randy found an old worn-out parchment covered in dirt on one of the cave floors. Recognizing none of us knew about folklore creatures, he decided to take pictures and send them to his cousin who majored in anthropology and had extensive knowledge about folklore stories worldwide. Frantically waiting for a reply from his cousin, we continued pacing along the cave as urgently as possible until he finally got a response. We should exit immediately. None of us knew why Randy's cousin suggested leaving the cave urgently, but... We trusted her expertise and hastily made our way out. As we stepped out of the cave, Randy's phone buzzed with another message from his cousin detailing a chilling revelation. The creature in her opinion was a lycanther, beasts known to feast on human flesh in various cultures' mythologies. The realization hit us hard as rescuing our team and stopping that beast became our ultimate life mission. We shared the information with our team, understanding that nobody was prepared for this encounter. Yet, those remaining decided not to leave unanswered questions behind and face the threat head-on together with me and Randy leading them. We retraced our steps back to the cave to confront the lycanther when a blood-freezing roar shook us as it emerged right before us, its teeth stained red from its latest prey. Its presence paralyzed all but one. A sniper in our team acted fast, firing a shot directly into one of the creature's eyes. The lycanther roared in agony. Its blind rage diverted towards us while the injured beast blindly lunged at anyone nearby. Struggling to dodge its relentless deadly attacks, we could hear sirens approaching as backup rushed towards our location. Finally, Heavily armored SWAT agents arrived on scene to assist us and successfully immobilized the creature, capturing it once and for all. 
We all watched as it snarled furiously even when subdued, jaws snapping at thin air. Through this harrowing experience, I discovered my reason for constantly risking my life despite fear or danger, to protect society from threats like these which lurk in the shadows without discrimination. Our wounded team member eventually recovered from his injuries, but he was no longer fit for duty both mentally and physically. As for me, I continue my work as a police officer with heightened vigilance knowing that monsters do exist beyond our wildest nightmares, and that any police officer knows a mundane life is something to cherish, as it could suddenly be replaced by an uncontrollable nightmare. The Lycanthor's existence, however, remains kept secret by authorities in an effort to prevent widespread panic. Yet, for those of us who survived this horrendous encounter, we carry the heavy burden knowing that even fiction can become terrifying reality. I never expected that my part-time job as a park ranger would lead me to such a chilling experience. But there I was in the Appalachian wilderness desperately trying to make sense of my reality. My name is Braylon Burroughs, and I consider myself an outdoors enthusiast. I grew up hiking and camping in these woods with my family, always feeling safe and at home in nature, until that day. A group of hikers had reported mysterious incidents in the remote area around Saluda Valley. While on my routine patrol, I encountered Sarah Feldman and Ravi Kesha two fellow rangers who were looking into the peculiar reports. Trackers in nature, they were familiar with tracking elusive animals that lurked in the shadows. We decided to join forces and investigate together. Ensuring our walkie-talkies were charged, we set out to explore the remote area. Though we had radio contact with other rangers and the exact coordinates for a quick rescue— we couldn't shake the ominous aura surrounding us. As anticipated, my fellow rangers were now snapping into action as they spotted unusual broken branches nearby. Further into the thick woodland, we found ourselves at an abandoned logging camp. The eerie remains appeared long forgotten disheveled cabins stood decaying amongst discarded rusted tools. Our surroundings became eerily quiet while examining these forgotten relics. Even the sound of a twig snapping seemed to echo throughout. Suddenly Sarah motioned towards blood-stained claw marks on one of the cabins. Having seen bare claw markings before, these seemed different, larger and more sinister. That was our cue to call for backup over the radio as we couldn't easily dismiss our gnawing apprehension. Emboldened by our collective resolve, we continued investigating with weapons in hand while Ravi told light-hearted jokes attempting to ease our guests' fears about eerie circumstances. Something abruptly caught his eye mid laughter. A grotesque pile of animal carcasses lay partially devoured nearby. To put it mildly, the gut-wrenching sight couldn't have been a mere result of natural predation. As the sun began to descend into late afternoon, the thick canopy of trees overhead cast an unsettling shadow blanket over our path. It was growing ever colder. We needed extra clothing and supplies to endure through the night. Feeling too on edge to leave each other's side, we contacted camp for support. When Kendrick, the ranger delivering our supplies, arrived around dusk, he insisted on staying with us. He was visibly spooked, more so than any of us earlier, and that made me question our decision-making process. However, this only assured me that trust in each other and our ranger training would prevail. Night fell quickly after Kendrick's arrival, and we gathered in one of the cabins for shelter, using flashlights to illuminate the space. We could still communicate over radio, but chose not to jeopardize revealing our location considering the vulnerability it may invite. Keeping our conversations to a minimum was an unspoken agreement shared among us. 
As Kendrick shared anecdotes about his family back home in Michigan, a sudden panic scream cut through his soft-spoken recollections. The sight of fear in his eyes became a mirror reflecting my own dread as we scrambled outside into the impenetrable darkness to identify its source. Turning towards night vision goggles for a clearer visual amid chaos, I caught my first glimpse of the monstrous antagonist lurking amidst tall trees and thicket. The creature was immense with muscular limbs adorned by dagger-like claws that would have made its predecessor shudder. Its bloodshot glare not only emitted terror but demanded fearful admiration as every move we made betrayed my mind's plea to remain discreet. We had yet to see what this beast was capable of inflicting upon helpless animals, though reconsidering those chilling carcasses gave me a profoundly disturbing clue. Unsure if it could sense our presence, we readied our firearms, praying they'd deter potential aggression. In this moment of heightened anticipation and paralyzing dread, the creature grew silent. We dared not to breathe or move as not to provoke the beast or telegraph our location. The gradual increase in tempo stirred the unspoken anxiety between us. Our radio remained ominously silent. As the unbearable silence continued to stretch on, I realized that we needed to act fast. Our group huddled together, discussing our options. Calling for help seemed like the most rational course of action, but we feared that drawing more people into this nightmarish situation would only end in more tragedy. Our only choice was to find a way to escape without alerting the creature of our intent. We split up into two groups, each armed with nothing but our wits and sheer determination. As we moved stealthily through the forest, I prayed the beast wouldn't find us. The agonizing tension continued to build within me. Every snap twig or rustling leaf hammered like a nail into my already frayed nerves. In response to these sounds, my reflexes tightened my grip on my weapon, while my mind raced through potential strategies for survival in case of a sudden attack. Without warning, the creature pounced on one of our own, Sarah. The gruesome scene unfolded before us as it sank its dagger-like claws into her flesh and tore her apart with an almost unnatural strength we never witnessed before. Her screams echoed through the dark, casting a painful symphony in our ears. Shock coursed through me in waves, contorting my face into a twisted mask as I desperately fought back tears. Sarah's horrible fate kept replaying in my mind like an anguished melody stuck on loop. With renewed determination and guilt haunting our every step, we continued our journey through the darkness, mind set on revenge and escape. Eventually, we reached what appeared to be an abandoned cabin providing temporary respite from the hellish pursuit. Inside the cabin, we scoured for anything of use— a weapon or clue to help us understand this horrific creature hunting us down. Hidden behind dust-covered shelves, I discovered a book filled with familiar images embellished under layers of grime, drawings that mirrored the grotesque visage of the monster haunting our lives. Upon closer inspection, the book seemed to be an old, handwritten compilation of local folklore. Flipping to a specific page with a detailed illustration of a beast not unlike the one tracking us, I discovered its species, a niker. According to the book, these vile creatures were menacing shapeshifters emerging from the shadows of forgotten legends and myths. Noticing that these malevolent entities thrived in dark environments, an idea took root. If we could gather enough light to overwhelm it, Perhaps the creature would weaken or flee. The remaining group members scrounged for anything capable of producing brightness, fire, lanterns, and our flashlights. Standing at the entrance of the cabin with our makeshift armaments in hand, we heard the creature's distinct growl approaching, an almost deafening affirmation that our time was running out. Heaving a collective breath, we braced ourselves for the confrontation ahead. As soon as it appeared within range, 
we unleashed an inferno of fire and light upon the monstrous figure. It recoiled from the onslaught, emitting guttural screeches and snarls. We pressed together as an impenetrable wall of illumination, forcing it further back into the darkness where it belonged. Cursing through clenched teeth and seemingly weakened by our combined efforts, the creature finally retreated into obscurity, vanishing like a nightmare dissipating upon waking. Exhausted from our ordeal but invigorated by victory, we embraced and offered tearful eulogies for Sarah's valiant spirit. In a single unexpected incident, we had faced the preternatural terror from beyond the realm of comprehension, and won. Yet Sarah's tragic loss served as a grim reminder that survival carried burdens and consequences. Emerging from that night's gruesome battle for survival, a testament to human resilience and courage, we vowed never to forget her sacrifice or those chilling days spent hunted by an ancient horror. Realizing the strength that united us, and the fact that we faced our deepest fears, our ragtag group left the nightmare behind and returned to the world of the mundane with a newfound appreciation for life's light amongst its darkest shadows. I was setting up camp after a long day of hiking when I happened to glance up and catch the sunset over the dense pine forest in Minnesota. My name is Luke Carrington, and I've always been drawn to nature, ever since my father took me fishing when I was just a kid. As a freelancer, with no wife or children, I took any chance I could to explore the great outdoors. As the sun dipped below the horizon and an eerie silence settled over the woods, a guttural growl pierced the air. Suddenly alert, I grabbed my flashlight and scanned my surroundings. Little did I know how my life would change from that moment onward. I met Rachel Watts and her brother Daniel at a nearby campsite that night. They were sitting by their fire, drinking beers and laughing at each other's jokes. Feeling uneasy from the strange growl earlier, I invited myself over to their fire for safety in numbers. While making introductions around the crackling fireplace and listening to Rachel's hilarious stories of her clumsiness, we heard rustling in the foliage nearby. Startled, we all turned towards the sound, straining our eyes to make out any shapes behind the branches. The beams from our flashlights caught something moving swiftly in the darkness, something large and muscular. The creature let out another fierce growl before vanishing deeper into the woods. We exchanged fearful glances. None of us had ever encountered anything like this before. It's probably just a bear, said Daniel hesitantly. No way, responded Rachel nervously. There's no bear with that kind of speed, unless it was starved. Whatever it was, we agreed that hunkering down together for the night would be our best option for safety. Despite this decision, sleep remained elusive for all three of us. The next morning, while gathering our gear to leave as quickly as possible, we found evidence of the creature's grisly deeds nearby. Torn shreds of clothing and twisted bones were all that remained of some unfortunate hiker or camper. The gory sight only heightened our sense of urgency, driving us to move away from this nightmarish hellscape. As we made our way through the wilderness, trying to find civilization during daylight hours, we couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. At various points, Rachel would insist she had glimpsed the creature— its eyes shiny like glass, stalking us silently from a distance. This revelation left us even more shaken and desperate to find help. With no reception on our cell phones due to the remote location, we decided to split up. Luke and Daniel would search for someone who could offer assistance, while Rachel stayed behind to guard their makeshift camp. The brothers crept cautiously through the endless trees, their senses on high alert and muscles tense with adrenaline. Suddenly, 
A blood-curdling scream echoed through the forest. Rachel was in danger. Ignore it, advised Daniel calmly. It could be that creature mimicking her voice to lure us into a trap. Damn it, exclaimed Luke quickly thinking on his feet. All right, I'll go back for her anyway. It's too risky leaving her alone. He ran back to camp with fear coursing through his veins. As I sprinted back toward the camp, images of Rachel's terrified face flashed through my mind. Every broken twig and crunch of leaves beneath my feet only heightened the sense of danger enveloping us all. Upon reaching the camp, I found Rachel sitting on the ground, her limbs shaking uncontrollably. Blood soaked the foliage nearby, evidence of a struggle mere moments prior. Keeping a wary eye out for any movement, I called out to her, trying to get her to gather herself. Rachel, we need to move now. My voice was firm but quiet, unwilling to alert whatever lurked just beyond the shadows. She nodded systematically and rose to her feet, leaving behind the gruesome sight. We continued together back through the forest, always looking over our shoulders in paranoia. Until we knew for certain what hunted us, calling for help might invite even more danger. As we met with Daniel several miles away from the original campsite, he offered a shocking revelation. I think I know what's after us, Daniel whispered as we caught our breath. I found some old markings on a carved tree trunk. It looks like it's been here for centuries. He pulled out his phone to show us a picture, and then continued, I tried searching online for anything similar and stumbled upon a detailed folktale about a creature known as Glastig. Glastig? I questioned him skeptically. Yet nothing could prepare me for what would come next. According to Daniel's research, this creature was once human but had since become something far more dangerous, twisted and consumed by darkness. As it took on animal-like behavior— and viciously hunted anyone who entered its territory, its physical characteristics mutated further into an inhuman visage. Twisted bones framed its emaciated body as if it were rotting alive. The Glastig had haunted local folklore for centuries, driving fear into countless hearts. Now it seemed to be stalking us as well and, with no way of knowing how to confront or escape it, our situation seemed hopeless. Even so, we refused to give up, desperate to find some semblance of safety or means of communication. We quickly developed a plan. Daniel and Rachel would watch our backs while I went ahead and scouted for any signs of a road or a nearby town. It was risky but necessary. We all agreed that there was no other choice if we hoped to survive this waking nightmare. As I searched through the dense forest— Strange noises echoed around me leaves rustling, distant animal calls, and the faint sound of water dripping from the treetops. It felt like my reality had melted away, replaced by a monstrous landscape straight out of the stories my grandmother used to tell me as a child. Finally, I stumbled upon a dirt road this had to lead somewhere. Just as I whipped around to signal my companions that I had found something— Rachel's gasps of horror rang out in the distance. I raced back toward them only to find Daniel clutching his leg, blood streaming down his torn clothing. Glastig had attacked. Rachel managed to drag him away from the creature before it could do more damage, but now he was gravely injured and needed help quickly. Gritting my teeth in determination, I shared the news about the road with them we would follow it, and hope for salvation. It took us hours to make our way along the dirt path with Daniel limping terribly due to his injury. Yet just as dawn broke through the tree's canopy above us, we found ourselves on the outskirts of a small town. Buildings loomed ahead like beacons amidst this sea of darkness. We tended to Daniel's wounds as best we could in a small town clinic which thankfully wasn't deserted after all. As we sat silently in the waiting room, 
drained from the horrors we had experienced during the last harrowing days. I vowed never to forget our fallen companions or the terror that lurked within the shadows. Our ordeal was over, but our hearts would forever bear the scars of this impossible encounter with the sinister Glastig. Let it be known that even in a world devoid of mysticism and ancient beliefs, there are still horrors hidden among us, lurking just beneath the surface of what we think is reality. The battle might be behind us, but a newfound awareness of darker forces would forever accompany us on whatever paths lay ahead in life. I was sitting in my favorite diner in Colfax, California, sipping coffee and mulling over the recent events in my life. Just yesterday, I'd lost my job as a geologist, budget cuts, they said. My name is Steve Huxley, it's not the first time I've found myself unemployed. This must be my lucky streak, I mumbled while taking another gulp of coffee. As I finished my meal, the last thing on my mind was some otherworldly creature out to get me. In fact, I was more preoccupied with how I'd pay my bills for the month. A few locals had gathered around a table behind me, talking about strange howling on the edge of town and livestock gone missing overnight. Their lively conversation caught my attention, but I dismissed it as small-town gossip. Time flew and darkness descended upon the town. With nothing better to do, I decided to pack some gear and set off for a walk into the nearby woods. It had been ages since I relished nature's glory under the stars. Surely this would ease my troubled thoughts. Little did I know that an odd and terrifying experience awaited me. As I wandered deeper into the woods, everything appeared ordinary, just the typical tall trees, chilly air, and quiet serenity one would expect at night. A sudden bang startled me. Could it have been a hunter's gunshot or a branch snapping? It left me with an uneasy feeling that someone or something was lurking in the darkness. Clambering through vegetation, eventually I stumbled upon what appeared to be a grotesque sight. A mangled deer carcass sprawled amongst muddied leaves. The stench assaulted my senses as flies buzzed around this grisly scene in gory delight. Instinct mandated tread cautiously and retrace my steps, getting tiny hairs to quiver on end with sheer terror. But curiosity bested me. I needed to know what had done this horrific act. Was there a predator stalking the woods so close to town? If so, it was crucial to warn everyone. Further explorations uncovered evidence of more dead animals in similar conditions, none seemed natural. Skulking in shadows, I suddenly spotted a monstrosity far beyond any figment of the human imagination. The vile creature had the rough shape of a canine but was drastically larger and stood on its hind legs. Mottled ashen white skin wrapped around an emaciated frame like a nightmarish cellophane, with elongated arms ending in razor-sharp claws. Its face was an abomination, beady red eyes staring straight into my soul, and a gaping maw revealing rows of serrated teeth enthralled by drooling lust for prey. Somehow I managed to turn and sprint away without revealing my presence, at least that's what I hoped. Raging through underbrush in my frantic flight, I prayed it wouldn't see or smell me, before long, arriving back in the heart of town provided temporary relief. Panic citizens needed to be told about the monster lurking nearby. Rushing to the nearest public place, the same diner I'd been in earlier that day, bursting through doors, pounding on tables shouting, Help! Listen to me! There's something out there! The townspeople exchanged disbelieving glances filled with reservations and apparent dismissals, though eventually a lime-drenched farmer named Clarence Kershaw lent his ears. It struck me that these were simpler times without limitless ways for distress calls. 
overwhelmed by adrenaline-fueled determination, my words came erratically as recounting experiences from those dark woods upon Clarence. Detailing this ghastly creature adept at killing livestock and leaving mangled remains its wake. Clarence's face went pale, realizing that I wasn't joking about the creature. He yelled out to the diner patrons, This is serious. We need to gather a team to confront this thing. The murmurs continued, and everyone in the diner seemed to be on high alert. Some agreed with Clarence, while others were skeptical, claiming that it's some local folklore and not a real threat. Despite the doubts, a group of brave townspeople, including the town sheriff and several farmers and hunters armed with rifles, ventured into the woods to deal with this potential danger. As we moved through the forest, staying close together and on high alert, the eerie silence grew more unnerving. Unexpectedly, screeches echoed through the trees. We halted in our tracks as our eyes searched for whatever horror was lurking just out of sight. Suddenly, a farmer named Jim cried out in pain. The terrifying beast had ambushed him from behind. Its vicious claws slashed through the air as Jim fought for his life. Within seconds, his body was riddled with gashes as blood splattered on those around him. In unison, our firearms roared towards the creature, yet despite our efforts, it evaded most shots but not without injuries. Wounded but still formidable, it snarled at us before launching another horrifying attack. Two more men fell in agony, their anguished cries mixed with shrill screams from the creature itself. Our bullets ripped through its slick skin and injured it even more but didn't stop it entirely. As people nursed their wounds and reloaded their weapons, I spotted a tattoo shop across the street from my hiding spot. I decided to take refuge there not prepared for more carnage. With adrenaline taking over my senses again, I darted to safety just as armed reinforcements arrived. Soon after entering the tattoo shop's dim interior, I discovered an older woman named Millie who claimed to know of the creature. She recounted an ancient tale about a beast called Kernan, a terror that had haunted these lands long before this town existed. Creatures of myth, like Kernan, were so deeply ingrained in local folklore that their legends remained shrouded in mystery. Millie shared illustrations and descriptions from ancient texts to corroborate her claims. Karnan's appearance, attributes, and the trail of carnage it left behind eerily matched the grotesque abomination I had encountered. Suddenly, gunfire tore through the air outside once more. My hopes quickly faded as the agonized screams of more victims filled my ears. It seemed that Kernan has been momentarily weakened but not killed. With profound sadness, I looked at Millie and asked if there was a way to stop Kernan for good. She sighed grimly, informing me that no historical records mentioned any long-term solutions other than temporary methods like traps or poisoning. I knew now that there would be no victor in this bloody battle, only more victims. It seemed Kernan's insatiable lust for blood came with an aptitude for survival and an immense tolerance for pain. Our pursuit against such a primal force was as futile. As the night wore on, and more numbers added to Kernan's victim count, I couldn't imagine how many of my friends and neighbors were now gone forever. We were defeated by an ancient evil born from long-forgotten folklore. The unbearable weight of the tragedy engulfed me as I hid from further carnage. As dawn broke over what had once been a peaceful town, the terrible onslaught of Kernan had finally come to its end. The townspeople cautiously emerged while the serpent-like monster retreated into unfathomable depths beyond our reach. The families mourned those who had perished at the hands of gruesome beasts, leaving us to question whether we would ever feel safe in our once tranquil town again. The dreadful shadow of Kernan will forever remain a vivid nightmare for those who witnessed it.
I was out exploring with my buddies, Patrick Merriweather and Isaac Evans, when we came across a deserted cabin in an isolated part of Wyoming. This location was perfect to set up a base camp for our weekend hikes. I'm Wilford Walden, by the way, grew up as an only child in an urban part of Baltimore. My love for nature has always been as strong as my sense of humor. This weekend getaway was just what we needed. The cabin appeared abandoned long ago. It was surrounded by the breathtaking forest landscape typical of this area, providing some respite from our stressful city lives. We could already smell the aroma of pine wafting through the air, rejuvenating our senses. Within minutes of settling in, we heard shrieks echoing through the woods. Patrick looked visibly nervous but tried to laugh it off with a clumsy joke about updating his will. We figured it was a fox or another animal having some fun at our expense, so we brushed it off and started unpacking our belongings. The following morning over breakfast, Isaac said he felt like someone or something had been observing us from outside the cabin last night. The unsettling feeling weighed heavy on our minds throughout the day. Over time, we noticed strange claw marks on trees and trampled bushes nearby, signs that an unusually large animal has moved through here not terribly long ago. Curiosity outweighed fear. We all started discussing theories of what sort of creature could have made these trails. As dusk fell upon us one evening, I suggested a quick hike before turning in for the night. We followed one trail that seemed more distinct than others. The path led us deeper into the dense woodland until finally we reached a small clearing, and there it was. We were taken aback at the sight before us, a grotesque creature with coarse hair all over its body and sharp teeth protruding from its colossal mouth, which emitted low guttural sounds. We could see its colossal, muscular arms and legs each ending in razor-sharp claws the length of our forearms. No words were exchanged among us. We all knew that this terrifying beast was the cause of the distressing marks throughout the forest. Our instinct to call for help was quashed as the creature bellowed savagely, sending an icy shiver down our spines. The remoteness of our location meant that help would take too long to arrive and more crucially— we couldn't provide a reasonable explanation for what we encountered without sounding insane. Pure adrenaline kicked in as we turned and began sprinting along the path back towards our cabin, with the sound of the creature huffing and growling close on our heels. Forgone was my inclination to joke or lighten the atmosphere. We all realized at once how dire our situation had become. We stormed inside the cabin and quickly barricaded the entrance. Patrick tried to steady his breathing, hands shaking uncontrollably as he leaned against a wall for support. The terrifying encounter was still vivid in our minds, a sight that seemed both otherworldly and all too real at the same time. And then, a sudden thud against the cabin door startled us back into reality. The beast had immediately become relentless in its pursuit, trying to claw its way inside with every bit of force it could muster. We scoured the cabin for anything that could be used as a weapon. Our best hope lay in an old hunting rifle we had discovered when first unpacking our supplies. My hands trembled as I held the gun, knowing that I would have only one opportunity to fend off this imposing adversary. I heard Isaac pleading with Patrick to find another way out but soon realized there was no other option. The wooden door groaned under the constant onslaught from this mysterious brute. Its vigorous bounding and battering wouldn't cease until it penetrated our makeshift haven. Time seemed to stand still. My heart pounding in my chest, sweat dripping from my brow, I raised the rifle and prepared to face the unknown. I could feel the very moment our protective wall would give way, allowing the sinister creature entry to carry out whatever horrifying intentions it possessed. The door finally burst open, revealing the horrifying creature we had only briefly encountered earlier. 
It was a mix of animal and human features, grotesque and twisted in form. Its fur-covered body, muscular and hunched over, exposed sharp claws at the ends of elongated limbs. But the most terrifying part was its face, a horrible hybrid of animalistic rage and terrifying human-like intelligence. I shouted at Patrick and Isaac to find any possible way out as I raised my rifle and fired a shot directly at the creature's head. To my utter shock, it did not deter the beast. It only enraged it further. Patrick screamed as he was attacked first, his arms desperately trying to fend off the creature as it tore into him with its horrible claws. Isaac and I were too panicked to help him effectively. We scrambled towards a small window near the back of the cabin, shattering it quickly to make our escape. Suddenly, there was an eerie silence inside the cabin. The attack on Patrick had stopped. Isaac jumped through the broken window first, disappearing into the dense woods outside. I hesitated for a moment before following suit. I knew deep down that we should have helped Patrick— but our fear made us run like cowards instead. The guilt would later consume me. Blindly heading deeper into the forest without a solid plan, I stumbled upon an abandoned campsite in disarray. The remnants of a camper's luggage caught my attention. Something in particular stood out, a book called Encyclopedia of Mythology and Folklore. I opened it to discover various illustrations depicting creatures of legend. My entire body froze when I saw a drawing that looked strikingly similar to our attacker from earlier. It was identified as Cernabog, literally, the Black God, a malevolent being known in Eastern European folklore. As terror gripped me anew, I frantically fumbled for my phone in hopes of calling for help realizing that I had left it back at the cabin in the midst of our desperate escape. The bleak reality settled in. No help would arrive. Suddenly, I heard heavy footsteps approaching. My mind raced, contemplating my next move. If engaging the creature was out of question and calling for help was impossible, my only option left was to hide and pray that I remained unseen. I found a small makeshift shelter nearby, just big enough to conceal me and hastily crawled inside. There, I lay down, barely breathing, my heart pounding in my ears as the footsteps drew closer. I stayed there for what felt like an eternity. Finally, the thudding steps retreated into the distance as dawn began to break. I mustered the courage to leave my hideout, and began making my way back to the cabin. Reaching the cabin, I found it eerily empty. Patrick was gone, although a trail of blood hinted at his terrible fate. Then one crushing realization set in. Isaac never made it out either. I sank to my knees, sobbing. Friends lost, hunted by this monster from folklore. I couldn't grasp how my life had fallen apart so quickly. Then a spark of resolve sparked within me. Were it not for that book on folklore lying coincidentally at that abandoned campsite, we would have never known about Cernabog. Our primal fears wouldn't have had a name. With newfound determination and a sick sense of tribute to those who didn't make it out alive, I picked up a shard of broken glass from the shattered window earlier. My goal now became singular— banish this wretched beast from existence before it could claim more lives. With teary eyes and an improbable plan forming in my mind, I stepped outside to confront Cernabog one last time, hoping against hope that maybe, just maybe, we'd have one last fighting chance. I was driving down a narrow, winding road through the dense forest of upstate New York when I decided to pull over and stretch my legs. My name's Derek Sonder, a mechanic from a small town nearby. It had been a long day at work and I needed to take a break before continuing home. 
The crescent moon shone through the gaps in the tree branches as the sounds of crickets chirped all around me. As I stopped by a fallen log, the wind rattled leaves passing eerily close to my ankles. I shivered and wrapped my arms tightly around myself, trying to keep warm. It was then that I heard it, soft footsteps echoing somewhere in the dark depths of the woods. I paused to listen keenly but dismissed it as the night playing tricks on me. A middle-aged man came stumbling out of the woods smeared in blood and dirt. I recognized him as my next-door neighbor, Clarence Warren. He began blurting out an incoherent story about his wife Patricia. With my help, he managed to explain how she'd been dragged off by some monstrous creature deeper into the forest. Fear gripped me even though I didn't fully understand what happened or what Clarence saw. Desperate to search for Patricia ourselves, we ventured back into those looming woods. Armed with only our flashlights, we crept deeper into its darkness where our only light sources were our tiny beams slicing through the gloom. Clarence's tales became more jumbled stories of something crawling within those trees, something sinister. The air grew colder, chilling us both through our protective winter wear. Conversation turned into whispers as we tensed upon feeling unseen eyes watching us from beyond the shadows of tall trees. Suddenly we heard it again, those distinct footsteps crunching twigs and dried flora underfoot in an almost predatory manner. We stood their heart pounding and breath ragged beneath deafening silence save for those thudding steps slowly approaching. Before I could react— a horrid growl thundered in the darkness, and we knew we were in its territory. It became clear the predator was this demonic beast stalking us from within the shadows. Panic surged into our veins, and we dashed through that tangled undergrowth, our fear driving us as one primal force against this unknown monster's vast presence. We ran blindly through the darkness searching for any way to escape those pursuing footfalls immersing themselves closer with each falling heartbeat. We stumbled upon an abandoned cabin standing alone in a small clearing obscured by untamed wilderness. Holding on to each other, we threw that door wide open and bolted inside in hopes of sanctuary from our unseen pursuer tirelessly stalking mere steps behind us. It was then we heard the rustling of leaves and branches momentarily relent before resuming all around that cabin's fragile wooden frame, our antagonist taunting us from within Shadow's veil. Clarence muttered something about a shotgun passed down generations from his father. I could see it leaning against the far wall. With trembling hands and broken resolve, he clumsily loaded those shells into the firearm's ancient chambers knowing fully well it might not be enough to protect us from this nefarious creature hounding our every move. We barricaded ourselves within that dusty haven of unkempt wooden floors and decaying wallpaper, hoping to catch our breath as we awaited some momentary security born from sheer adrenaline-fueled determination. Our ears strained desperately listening for any sign of movement outside in those increasingly oppressive woods where shadows loomed thicker with each passing second. An abrupt guttural snarl burst forth shattering what little peace remained with echoing finality. It was closer now, much closer. The cabin shook on its weak foundation as those grotesque claws scratched relentlessly at that flimsy door we'd slammed shut in futility. Cold wind flowed through the cracks, hitting our faces like ice daggers, no doubt carrying upon it the toxic scent of our terror. Desperation choked us as that hideous creature pounded against the wooden frame upon which our fragile existence precariously rested. The door began splintering, broken by wild fury invoked by sheer primal hunger and instinctual malice. Sweat glazed our brows as we prepared for what we knew to be an inevitable confrontation between man and beast where hope was a fading illusion in these merciless woods. I grabbed my friend's arm and pulled him towards the window. We need to escape through there, I whispered urgently. 
He nodded in agreement, his eyes wide with fear. Together, we managed to pry open the old window and hastily climbed out into the night. We sprinted through the dense forest, branches whipping our faces while we desperately tried to put as much distance as possible between us and that grisly monster. The sound of its roar followed us through the darkness, growing closer despite our frantic efforts. As we ran, I thought about calling for help but quickly realized how futile it would be. Even if someone heard our cries, they wouldn't be able to reach us in time or combat this malicious beast plaguing us. It seemed that all hope was lost and that we had become nothing more than prey for this insidious predator. Our flight continued until my friend tripped on an exposed root and fell. My heart pounded in my chest as I struggled to help him up, knowing that monster would be upon us within seconds. Attempting to shield him from its lethal grip, I couldn't suppress a shriek as its colossal figure appeared before us. As I examined its grotesque form more closely, it became clear what it was, a hideous amalgamation of human limbs and feral animalistic features. Its snout drooled with venomous saliva, dripping onto the forest floor, while its massive arms seemed capable of tearing someone apart effortlessly. To my astonishment, my friend managed to pull out his phone and snapped a photo of the beast, despite his trembling hands. As he did so, the creature hesitated for just a moment before letting out another horrifying roar and lunging towards us. I pushed my friend out of the way with every ounce of strength left in me, taking the force of the brutal attack. Severe pain consumed me as sharp claws ripped into my flesh leaving my vision clouded with red. The last thing I remember was my friend's anguished cries before everything went black. When I finally awoke, I found myself lying in a hospital bed with my friend sitting beside me. He explained how after the creature had attacked me, it seemed to lose interest and retreated back into the darkness, leaving us alone but irreversibly scarred by the terrifying experience. While recovering, my friend handed me his phone, displaying a blurry image of the monstrous entity responsible for our torment. He had done some research using this photo, determined to answer what hellish creature had been our tormentor. As he showed me articles upon articles about various creatures from ancient folklore, we finally uncovered its identity. It was an embodiment of primal rage and malice, the likes of which preyed upon anyone who dared trespass upon its territory. While not mentioned in popular culture or commonly known, it had been described throughout history as a nightmarish creature stalking unsuspecting victims and inflicting unspeakable terror upon them. Our fates seemed to be sealed once we entered that cursed forest, and our confrontation with this monster would become a part of such timeless tales, whispers of its horrors shared between generations. My heart aches for those who lost their lives to that gruesome beast— and snared by its relentless hunger for terror. Now, with my recovery nearing completion and my friends standing steadfastly by my side through this harrowing ordeal, we can only hope that this creature remains in the depths of the forest, trapped within the pages of myth where it belongs. For if there's one thing we've learned from this savage encounter— it's that humankind is no match for such an overpowering force born from primeval dread. I had always dreamt of visiting the Grand Canyon, and finally I made it. My name is Jerome Blackwood, and this was supposed to be the adventure of a lifetime. Little did I know that I was about to become entangled in something far beyond my comprehension. After a long day of hiking, I was ready for some rest and relaxation in my modest cabin. But during dinner at the local eatery, something caught my attention. A man nearby was talking in hushed tones with his friend. They spoke of unusual occurrences happening recently, 
with animals being found brutally mutilated, showing signs of gnashing and tearing. I brushed it off as mere gossip, but my curiosity had been piqued. The next day, I decided to hike in a more remote area than the previous day. As I traversed deeper into the desolate landscape, I stumbled across a gruesome sight, a torn carcass of an elk, its entrails spilled across the dusty earth. On closer inspection, I could see bite marks from large fangs or claws on the poor animal's flesh. Feeling uneasy but skeptical about what could have caused this mutilation, I turned back to warn others about what I had found. Along the way, I came across a group of fellow hikers who shared their experiences of seeing unknown tracks and noticing bizarre movements in the shadows. We agreed to report our findings together. As we spoke to park authorities about our gruesome discoveries and rumors swirling around town, they remained largely mute on the topic. Seemingly unconcerned or even dismissive towards our concerns, they offered no insight or assistance. Our growing uneasiness led to a night spent debating over campfires what creature or force could be responsible for such unsettling events. With so many diverse backgrounds represented among us, from biology majors to retired law enforcement officers, we attempted piecing together what little information we had collected. On the third day, our group trekked towards the site where I had initially found the mangled elk. We needed to uncover more concrete evidence to validate our theories. The further we ventured, the more the ominous atmosphere took hold of us. I caught myself constantly looking over my shoulder, convinced I saw movement on the edges of my vision. Later that afternoon, a blood-curdling scream pierced through the cold air. We sprinted towards the sound to find one of our fellow hikers cowering in fear before something I never thought possible. The beast was enormous, towering over us with thick, matted fur covering its gigantic frame emitting a nauseating stench unlike anything I had ever experienced. Its feral eyes reflected a malevolent intelligence that seemed incongruous with its vicious animalistic demeanor. Before we could react, it lunged at one of our own, a biologist named Wallace O'Connell. Panic coursed through my veins as I watched him being lifted off his feet and bitten in half by this monstrosity. Despite our unpreparedness and undeniable dread, we fought back using hiking poles as crude weapons to deter the creature long enough for the rest of us to put some distance between ourselves and this incomprehensible adversary. We knew there was no time to call for help, no chance of saving our friend who had already perished beneath the salivating maw of this grotesque horror. As we fled for our lives— abandoning everything we had carried on our journey, including any hope of understanding what had just transpired, it became abundantly clear that we were no longer hunters attempting to glean knowledge from an inexplicable series of events. We were now prey fighting for survival against a living nightmare. The creature relentlessly pursued us through canyons and ravines as our bodies neared exhaustion while adrenaline struggled to overcome fatigue. Our group beset by fear and despair began arguing over whether to stand our ground or push forward our luck. My eyes met the cold gaze of a retired police officer, Amanda Daniels, whose trembling hand held a handgun, poorly concealed in panic-stricken grip. With all semblance of reason disintegrated, Amanda took the lead while the rest of us followed suit. A heart-wrenching feeling overcome me while racing away from that terror just beyond the boundaries of my peripheral vision. Desperation electrified the air as we tried to maintain coherence long enough to hatch a plan. The unimaginable had happened, and our lives were now at the mercy of this menacing beast. Amanda, clearly disturbed by the sight before us, tried to summon help through her smartphone. Unfortunately, cell phone reception was non-existent in these desolate lands. Our limited knowledge of folklore offered no solutions, leaving us in an abyss of uncertainty. 
We continued onward, driven by the instinctual need for self-preservation. The creature stalking our every move was relentless in its pursuit. Its massive, twisted body left a destructive path. Trail markers and signs of our previous exploration lay shredded on the ground. The sheer terror that coursed through our veins fueled our determination to escape this nightmare. As we scrambled over rocks and through overgrown vegetation, each of us clung to a thread of hope that we might eventually find safety. For hours this ordeal continued until finally, exhausted and battered by the chase, we stumbled upon an unconventional refuge, an abandoned cabin hidden amid dense shrubbery. Seizing the opportunity that presented itself, we scrambled inside and secured every possible entrance against potential intrusion. Once reassured that we were as safe as possible given the circumstances, I turned my attention toward finding any means of communication within the cabin. Buried beneath a pile of weathered books and binders was a well-worn radio transmitter. The concept seemed archaic but offered some glimmer of possibility for rescue. I fiddled with the knobs to send out a distress signal when suddenly, a familiar voice pierced through the static, Simon Patel, our group's resident wildlife photographer. Shockingly, he informed us that he had managed to narrowly escape his encounter with the creature before it attacked us, taking refuge in a dense thicket when hope seemed lost. His escape had led him to stumble upon a small settlement down the canyon, home to an eccentric hermit with knowledge of local legends and creatures both mundane and mythical. It was the man's recollection that revealed the horrifying truth about our sinister stalker. Simon relayed that according to the hermit, we were being hunted by a creature known in local legends as Opikitak. The beast, driven to mercilessly pursue humans invading its territory, was said to have haunted these canyons for centuries. And now, our intrusion had provoked its wrath. The revelation was chilling and disheartening, striking fear into every marrow of our bones. However, Simon's voice conveyed a message of hope. His discovery had also led him to law enforcement officers stationed nearby. Informed about our situation and the existence of the monstrous Opic attack, their skepticism quickly faded as they listened in horrified intrigue. Moments after hearing from Simon and attempting to maintain calm composure, we heard something approach the cabin swiftly. For agonizing seconds, we braced ourselves for the assault of our relentless pursuer. The door creaked open hesitantly, revealing Simon with three officers, Don and Gwyn, Edith Richter, and Ethan Kingfisher. In that brief moment of relief from terror's vice-like grip came an opportunity for decisive action. Though our original plan was no longer viable— we found strength in numbers and remained united facing the unknown. We knew that with law enforcement accompanying us, rescue helicopters would arrive soon. Armed with this reassurance, palpable tension subsided slightly. Our collective focus shifted toward evacuating the canyon as quickly as possible, while avoiding crossing paths with Opic attack once more. In that brief moment of clarity amid chaos came a profound appreciation for life and all its precious moments. We had encountered something that most people would never experience, an elusive creature whose existence straddled the boundary between tangible life forms and local legend. Though it cost us one irreplaceable member of our group, their memory would live on in each retelling of our harrowing experience. As we boarded the rescue helicopter, we bade farewell to the rugged terrain that had been repurposed as both hideout and hunting ground. It was only then that I realized we had triumphed over an inevitable tragedy. The creature born from folklore and imprinted within our minds would forever serve as testimony of the dark, twisted valleys beneath that which we perceive as reality.
I stumbled upon an old map in the attic earlier, showing a small hidden trail deep in the Black Hills forest of South Dakota. Intrigued, I decided to take a weekend trip to check it out. My name's Douglas Wilkins, and documentary filmmaking always fascinated me. I thought exploring this area could make an excellent documentary if someday I got the chance. Before heading out, I called my best friend, Gideon Atkins, a history enthusiast who eagerly agreed to come along. We met at the trailhead and geared up for our adventure. As we hiked, Gideon speculated about what might be hidden deep in the forest, mentioning gold mines or perhaps Native American artifacts. Hours into our hike, we reached the final part of the trail marked on my map. The isolation was palpable. Not a single bird chirped or squirrel scuttled by. I couldn't help but nervously joke about how this would make a great horror film instead of a documentary. As we pressed on, we discovered an abandoned cabin, a perfect place to set up camp for the night and investigate our surroundings further. At dusk, Gideon started a campfire, and we continued chatting about our daily lives. Suddenly, we heard footsteps crunching in the leaves nearby. Worried that we were trespassing on someone's private property, we extinguished the fire and hid inside the cabin. Peering through a crack in the door, my heart dropped as I saw it, an enormous creature approaching us slowly. The moonlight revealed its terrifying features— matted fur covering an elongated body, dark eyes sunk into its skull-like face, and razor-sharp teeth glinting ominously as it snarled. This wasn't human, at least not anymore. We stayed motionless in our hiding spot and tried to be as quiet as possible while observing from inside the cabin. The creature sniffed around the campfire, growling softly. Panicked, I remembered that we had no cell service to call for help, even if we tried, who would even believe that we were being hunted by a monstrous creature. The beast circled towards the back of the cabin, and Gideon whispered that now was our chance. We quietly exited the cabin in the opposite direction and headed towards where we left our backpacks earlier. We hid them preemptively in case someone noticed. Carefully crouching near our backpacks, I glanced back, only to see the creature standing by the extinguished campfire, appearing so confident and sure, as if it knew we wouldn't escape. Gideon grabbed his machete from his backpack. It wasn't much against an unknown predator, but it might provide some defense. With adrenaline surging through our veins, we abandoned our original route— taking unpredictable paths through the dense trees to throw off any pursuit. Shuffling along, we rarely spoke but exchanged glances of determination, or perhaps fear. At one point, only fifty feet away, the creature dashed across our path. We held our breath and ducked behind some bushes as quickly as possible. The vile stench wafting in its wake made my stomach turn. As night turned into early morning, our sense of desperation heightened. We realized that we were hopelessly lost and completely unsure how to escape this relentless pursuer. Fortunate moments of silence were inevitably followed by distant growls or snapping branches, a chilling reminder that it was still out there. The first rays of sunlight triggered something inside me. Whether it was courage or foolishness doesn't matter now. I told Gideon we needed a plan to create a distraction so one of us could slip away safely and find help. Together, we set up an elaborate trap designed to catch or hinder the creature while simultaneously signaling for attention from anyone nearby. Tensions were high as we knew any sudden noise or movement might signal our doom. Stealthily, we took our positions, Gideon behind a fallen log, machete at the ready, and me towards the edge of the clearing with a single flare gun we carried for emergencies. This would either free us from this waking nightmare or lead us to our ultimate demise. Suddenly, the creature appeared in the clearing's center, heading straight towards me. 
The creature's eyes were fixated on me as it moved closer, its body emitting a terrifying growl. I could see its long, razor-sharp claws and its muscular limbs covered in matted fur. Its gait was lumbering and unnatural, but it was a predator in every sense of the word. Gideon signaled to me from behind the fallen log, his eyes urging me to be ready. I held the flare gun tightly in my grasp, preparing to fire once the creature was within range. It continued advancing upon me without hesitation or fear, seemingly undaunted by our presence. The tension grew as every second ticked by. Despite knowing we couldn't call for help in such a remote area, an overwhelming desire to try began to consume me. However, I knew that our only option was to confront the creature ourselves and hope our trap would work. As it reached the edge of the clearing, it paused for just a moment. Seizing this opportunity, I launched the flare straight at it while Gideon sprung up from his hiding spot and charged towards it with his machete raised. The flare made contact with the creature's fur and ignited it instantly, creating a bright flash followed by thick plumes of smoke. In that moment of distraction and panic, Gideon skillfully swung his machete and managed to slice through one of its legs, causing the monster to fall in agony. As it writhed on the ground, unleashing ear-piercing shrieks of pain and rage, Gideon approached a nearby tree trunk where we had rigged our makeshift trap, a collection of sharpened branches aimed at the creature's torso. As Gideon pulled on a rope we had set up earlier, the branches were released with great force towards their target. Mercifully, this trap was successful enough for us to escape, while the severely injured creature howled one last time before finally succumbing to its wounds. As we ran through the woods, swerving past trees and bushes in a frenzied dash, I couldn't help but feel the pang of guilt for not seeking outside help to deal with such a monstrosity. Once we were a safe distance away, we stopped to catch our breath in the forest and attempted to make sense of what had just happened. We discussed further about the creature and its appearance, trying to identify it from stories or legends we had heard before. Gideon recalled meeting a local who specialized in folklore during one of his previous hikes through this area. The man had told him about a beast called Lugaru, a creature resembling a mix between a wolf and a human. According to him, it was believed to be immortal unless injured severely enough by someone with knowledge of its nature. That information was all we had on the mysterious creature that had been stalking us. Despite my lack of knowledge in folklore, I knew that what Gideon described aligned frighteningly well with what we had encountered. The possibility that we stumbled upon such a malicious entity shook me to my core but I was grateful that we had been able to defeat it. As we continued making our way through the forest, seeking help amongst other hikers for both directions and medical support, Gideon swore that he would report his findings about the Lou Garu so no other unsuspecting individuals would meet the same fate as us. And so, our harrowing experience concluded as best it could have both of us alive and relatively unharmed compared to the alternative. The creature's haunting visage still lingers in my mind, but at least it won't ever be capable of tormenting anyone else again. It all started with a text message. My old friend Walden Johnson sent me a photograph of his latest wildlife project in Appalachia. He had discovered what appeared to be a strange and fascinating creature, one we'd never seen before. My name is Heathcliff Davenport, and I've always been captivated by the mysteries of nature. Little did I know, this experience would become much more than just a curiosity. Arriving at Walden's remote cabin late at night, I noticed tire tracks that veered off to the side near the woods. The sudden turn suggested something unusual or unexpected had happened. 
hearing creaking branches and rustling leaves outside my car window, I grabbed the flashlight from my glove compartment and reluctantly stepped out to investigate. With Walden, we took a day to track down the strange creature he had captured in his photograph. The hairs on my neck bristled as we heard its guttural growl coming from the distance. With trees towering over us and bellows of fog obscuring our path, there was an inexplicable sense of foreboding in the air. Soon after, we stumbled upon a grisly scene. Mangled remains of what used to be small woodland animals scattered about resembled twisted heaps of raw meat. Flies swarmed around the carnage like vultures, and blood stained the dark soil beneath us. What do you reckon could have done this? Walden asked as he knelt down to examine one of the carcasses. I couldn't help but think of how odd it was that there were no birds making noise nearby. Not even squirrels scurrying about, just silence. We continued moving deeper into the woods slowly, our breath strained from both fear and anticipation. In a clearing up ahead, sudden movement caught our eyes. There it was, a hulking silhouette that resembled an unholy hybrid between an ape and a beast. Its fur-coated frame had an unnatural fluidity as it moved, darting from one tree to another with eerie agility. We were captivated by the creature and kept following it, documenting its behavior through descriptive notes and diagrams in our notebooks. We had to know more about this seemingly perfect killing machine, the one responsible for the carnage we'd found. As the sun began to set, we realized we'd been led deeper into the forest than anticipated. In our enthusiasm, we'd forgotten to mark our trail back. The prospect of being stuck here overnight was now a reality, and our excitement turned to dread. We agreed to split up each taking a different direction in hopes of finding our way back. I stumbled alone through the thickening darkness, my steps growing more exhausted with each passing minute. The sounds of my cracking twigs underfoot suddenly became eerily omnipresent. Paranoia set in. Was that always me or had the creature been tracking me? Just then I frantically dug through my backpack for my phone only to remember that we hadn't had service since arriving at the cabin. Calling for help was impossible. There was only Walden and me out here. As if on cue, I heard distant screams pierce through the dead silence of the woods. Walden was in trouble. My heart pounded as I rushed headlong into the fray without thinking. There wasn't any other way around it. The scene that unfolded before me was gruesome enough to make even the strongest stomach churn. Walden's bloodied body laid motionless on the ground while his attacker stood over him triumphantly, its hulking mass bearing down like an oppressive weight. With anger and fear churning inside me like a tempest, I wrapped Walden's hands around my cold fingers. He was still alive yet barely conscious. This creature would not take yet another life today. I looked at the creature, which towered over us, its enormous frame and long, unnaturally bent limbs barely visible in the darkness. My mind raced as I tried to think of a plan that could help my friend Walden and me escape this nightmare. Run! I shouted, my voice breaking from sheer exertion. Without any other effective course of action, Walden and I began sprinting through the woods. The monster lurched forward in pursuit, its harsh breaths echoing through the forest as it clambered on all fours. Our desire to survive fueled our evasion, but exhaustion threatened to overtake us. Knowing we couldn't keep running forever, I remembered my backpack still contained a flare gun we brought for emergencies. Retrieving it as we ran felt like a Herculean task but managed it nonetheless. Aiming at the sky, I fired the flare, hoping someone might come to our rescue. In an unexpected turn of events, the creature showed disdain or perhaps fear toward the bright light. Seizing this opportunity to throw the creature off further, we darted between trees and changed directions repeatedly. 
While we maneuvered through the forest, my mind worked furiously trying to figure out what was attacking us. It was undoubtedly something beyond anything I had ever encountered before, a gruesome beast that seemed eerily familiar yet terrifyingly foreign at the same time. We eventually reached a nearby stream and decided to follow it downstream, hoping it would lead us to civilization. The sound of rushing water offered temporary solace but didn't drown out the haunting memory of our encounter with the creature. After several hours of walking along the stream in silence, we discovered a small cabin nestled in a clearing not far from the water's edge. Cautiously we approached it and were relieved to find its owner, an old man named Henry. Upon hearing our desperate tale of being pursued by this monstrous entity, Henry invited us into his cabin and listened intently as we recounted our terrifying ordeal. Henry, well versed in the history and folklore of the region, recognized the creature we described. He revealed that it was known as the Scrimsley, a legendary beast that inhabited the area for centuries. Although no one had seen it for years, stories about its attacks circulated among locals who often blamed it for disappearances and gruesome deaths. Although skeptical of folktales, I couldn't deny the validity of our horrifying encounter. While Walden and I were grateful to know the origins of our aggressor, we were left with no solution on how to protect ourselves from further savagery. The sound of distant sirens filled the air. It appeared that my flare had been noticed after all. Within moments, we heard vehicles approaching Henry's cabin. Squad cars surrounded the area, bringing a team of officers to investigate our cries for help. We shared our story with them and insisted that a search team be dispatched to capture or eliminate the Scrimsley before it harmed anyone else. Although they were hesitant to believe such an outlandish tale, they couldn't ignore Walden's injured condition and agreed to investigate. During the days following our narrow escape from the Scrimsley, Walden and I came to recognize that our survival had depended on sheer luck and determination. We mourned for those who had fallen victim to the wrath of this horrifying creature but found some solace knowing that we were able to give their disappearance a name, no matter how unbelievable it seemed. As time passed, many search parties combed the woods in search of evidence or traces of other victims, but found nothing conclusive. The Scrimsley remained elusive, haunting both locals and authorities alike with its gory legacy. Walden and I returned to life as best as we could, grateful for each day that unfolded without another confrontation with the Scrimsley. The impact of our harrowing experience served as a reminder that the world sometimes contained things too gruesome and terrifying for explanation. In the end, the creature eluded capture, hiding in the shadows and biding its time. Each passing day was a testament to our survival and a promise to never forget those who lost their lives in such a blood-curdling, unnatural conflict. I distinctly remember the sun was setting behind the tall canopy of trees, casting eerie shadows as I trekked through the dense Appalachian forest. My name is Kiefer Mays, an experienced outdoorsman from a long line of hunters and hikers. Feeling adventurous, I had ventured away from bustling city life for a weekend retreat in this remote corner of West Virginia. Letting my backpack, Laden with gear and supplies, I made my way up a steep incline to set up camp before darkness enveloped the area. The ground was uneven, making progress slow and laborious. Settle down, I said with a chuckle to myself a habit picked up from grueling hikes in the past. It helped me keep calm as I continued moving forward through the dense foliage. A mile into my journey... I stumbled upon a small clearing, perfect for setting up camp. As I began arranging my gear, I sensed something else in the area, 
an unsettling presence that had gone previously unnoticed. As daylight rapidly faded, I caught sight of an intriguing object amidst the leaves an old wallet with a crumpled ID belonging to Theron Qualls, a name unfamiliar to me. Examining it further revealed dried blood splatters on its surface and grooves resembling deep claw marks. Alarm bells rang in my head, yet curiosity got the better of me. Gathering courage to investigate further, an unmistakable growl filled the air guttural and resonant. It struck fear throughout my being but rendered me immobile out of dread for making any sound at all. Hiding behind tall bushes so I could observe without detection, my eyes were drawn toward movement nearby, barely visible amongst the dusky surroundings. A creature stepped into view, unlike any animal I had ever encountered or heard of before. Standing roughly seven feet tall at first glance, it possessed massive limbs covered in coarse hair. Rippling muscles swelled beneath each strand, culminating in razor-sharp claws capable of eviscerating a human with ease. Horns protruded from its angular skull, and an elongated snout dominated a face riddled with scars. Desperate to retreat unnoticed, my mind raced frantically for an escape plan while morbid curiosity urged me to continue observing the behemoth. As it approached the wallet I had just dropped, adrenaline surged through me along with some semblance of clarity. Realizing a quick getaway was critical, I slung my backpack over my shoulder and began silently backtracking towards the trailhead. My body trembled uncontrollably from fear and adrenaline, but I focused on maintaining a steady pace. Wanting to put more distance between us, I glanced back quickly realizing that stealth was futile. The monstrous animal anomaly had caught wind of my quiet footsteps and relentlessly pursued. Terror overtook me as I abandoned all caution and ran with desperation in my every step. Over here! shouted a voice nearby, Liara Belmonte, another hiker who must have witnessed our chase. Shortly after, she emerged from the underbrush and gestured urgently for me to follow her promising words that she knew the shortest route off this accursed mountain. She led me through thorny bushes and over jagged rocks in our desperate attempt to outweet and outrun this relentless hunter on our heels. Panting and sweat-drenched we reached what seemed like a dead end, a sharp cliff overlooked staring back at the angry swirls of rapids below. Leora then revealed her intentions. She too sought refuge within these woods after learning of people being inexplicably murdered or disappearing without a trace nearby. Her determination resonated within me, living within our newfound camaraderie, as survivors giving strength when we had none left to spare. In unison we turned our attention back to the thundering footsteps behind and stumbled upon a dire discovery the creature was still being chased away from us yet gaining ground as it lunged effortlessly through hurdles and barriers we found challenging. As I prepared to repel the onslaught, Leora rummaged through her bag for something that might make us feel safer, a rudimentary weapon, makeshift or bought. Leora's hands found a flare gun, and she swiftly handed it to me before grabbing a knife from the depths of her bag. Our makeshift weapons were far from ideal, but they seemed like our only hope as the creature bore down on us. The sound of its breath was deep and guttural, Nothing human or animal should have made that noise. Whatever this thing is, it's getting closer, Leora gasped. If we're going to make a stand, now's the time. I nodded, trying not to let fear command my actions. Gripping the flare gun tightly, I raised my arm to take aim at the monstrous beast. Just as it lunged towards us with frightening speed, I pulled the trigger. The flare arced toward the creature, illuminating its horrifying form in an eerie crimson glow. The sight was almost too much to bear. The monster had flowing, matted fur, sharp claws capable of tearing through flesh with ease. 
Its eyes glowed with a malevolent intelligence making it clear that this was no ordinary predator. It hunted and tormented for reasons beyond a basic need for sustenance. The flare collided with the creature's chest and burst into flames. Screeching in pain and fury, it stumbled back as the fire spread fiercely over its body. Leora seized this opportunity and charged it with her knife, aiming for any weak spot she could find. Despite our combined efforts, though, the creature refused to fall easily. It thrashed violently against both fire and blade even as its fur burned away revealing scarred and twisted flesh beneath. During one particularly fierce struggle, Liara was thrown mercilessly to the ground. As she lay gasping for breath amidst rocks and debris from our desperate flight, I desperately tried to find an answer amongst her belongings that might give us some hope. That's when I saw it, an old-looking book with worn covers filled with information on local legends. Leafing through the pages, a particular story caught my eye one which closely matched the nightmare we were facing. The legend spoke of a creature called El Chupacabra, a name that sent a wave of recognition through me. Although I had never been one to believe in such tales, the grisly scenes it described mimicked all too closely what was happening before my very eyes. It was a hunter that no one could outrun and was well known in these woods for devouring everything in its path. With newfound knowledge about our enemy, I scrambled back to Leora and helped her back onto her feet. This creature is El Chupacabra! I yelled over the chaos. Then we need to find a way out of here, she replied, panting heavily. Our only hope seemed to be finding a path downwards before the creature could recover from its injuries. Luckily, we spotted a precarious ledge leading away from this hellish landscape. Mustered as much courage as we could find, we began our descent onto this treacherous path as the flaming monster's cries echoed through the air behind us. As each step took us closer to safety, sheer determination replaced our fear. We pressed on and began to feel that perhaps we had finally thwarted El Chupacabra for good. Finally reaching level ground, relief washed over us like rain after an arduous drought. With every step away from the cliff where our fight occurred, dread gave way to a shared camaraderie born from desperation. In Leora's eyes lingered gratitude mixed with sorrow at all those who had not been so fortunate in their encounters with this nightmarish beast. El Chupacabra may continue to haunt those hillsides and forests, seeking prey upon which to inflict its own brand of terror. But for me and Leora Belmonte, we will always carry with us the memory of the day we faced it and lived to tell the tale. I remember the moment like it was just a brush stroke of time ago. I was sipping coffee in a small diner in West Virginia, joking around with the waitress named Rhiannon. So, you see... I said, chuckling. The chicken really crossed the road because he saw me coming. Back then, I was a researcher for a wildlife biology firm upstate. My name's Casimir Benton and my regular trips to West Virginia had become an escape from city life. Rhiannon's laughter echoed through the diner as I paid the bill and waved goodbye. Later that day, while exploring unmarked territory near the dense Monongahela National Forest, I discovered a seemingly abandoned cabin. The mystery around this cabin captured my interest, and having some free time, I decided to take a closer look. The small cabin stood solitary against the backdrop of dense trees and sunlight filtering through their foliage. As carefully as I could, I approached with measured steps— feeling each board creak beneath my feet. The door barely held together by rusted hinges groaned as old wood scraped against the splintering floor. To my surprise, the meager furnishings suggested someone still occupied the place. A neatly made bed stood in one corner, 
Cans of food were placed atop makeshift shelves and a cracked window pane allowed what little light there was inside. Most unsettling, though, was an array of newspaper cutouts pinned to one wall, all related missing persons in the area. This discovery sent chills up my spine. As I pondered the implications of those clippings, a sudden cacophony of snapping branches grabbed my attention. Whirling around towards the noise, I saw something dart into view an enormous and grotesque creature like no one had ever seen before its mottled skin shimmering as it moved with unnatural agility. Desperate but attempting to reason with myself, I thought maybe this animal was the source of all those people gone missing. I tried to maintain a calm exterior, making my way toward the door while keeping an eye on its movements. Despite the overwhelming panic teetering beneath the surface of my thoughts, I knew I couldn't just run. Moments later, I found myself outside the cabin and noticed that the thing had vanished into the forest. I decided to call Rhiannon for help as soon as possible due to little signal in this remote area. My heart pounded in my chest as I gripped my cell phone tightly attempting to recall something from my past experiences that would make sense of this mystery. Rhiannon, clearly alarmed by my frantic tone, asked me what was going on. You wouldn't believe it! I stammered, doing my best to string together a coherent thought. There's this cabin here in Monongahela, and inside there are newspaper cutouts about missing persons, and some strange creature lurking around. Damn it, Casimir! She whispered into the phone, voice shaken. You shouldn't be anywhere near there. Get out now! I took her advice immediately and began sprinting through the woods with blinding fear before me. The crunching leaves underfoot acted as a metronome for my terror-stricken pace. Every so often, I caught glimpses of movement in my peripheral vision or heard labored breathing other than my own. The creature seemed to toy with me, never coming too close but enough to keep dread gnawing at the edges of consciousness. As sunlight slowly retreated behind rolling mountains, darkness washed through the forest like a curse that had come to call this grim place home. Night brought new tricks and terror from my surrounding environment shadow creatures flickering at the floor, twigs cracking beneath quicksilver paws. Eventually, Heavy breaths billowed from somewhere just inches behind me. Then came a low growl that could shake bones and leave ice in the marrow. A sickening stench, like rotting meat hung in the air, making it difficult to breathe. Help! I screamed into the night, praying that someone would hear my desperate plea. Driven by an instinct to survive, I stumbled upon a clearing beside the ruins of an old farmhouse. Faint hope glimmered within as I scanned the area for any sign of salvation a shotgun, perhaps, or even just somewhere to hide. Desperate for salvation, I stumbled into the crumbling farmhouse. The wooden floors creaked and groaned underfoot as I searched for anything that could help. A moment of relief washed over me when I discovered a boarded-up window overlooking the clearing. Maybe they'll find me here. I thought, hoping whoever heard my earlier cry for help would come. From my new vantage point, I watched in horror as the creature emerged from the woods massive and covered in matted fur. It stood on powerful hind legs, resembling a bear but not quite. Its eyes glowed like fiery embers against its dark, twisted visage. Claws as long as knives scraped against the ground with every step it took. As the creature prowled near the farmhouse, I realized there was no way out. My desperate hope that someone might rescue me faded with each passing moment. Suddenly, I remembered my phone tucked into my pocket. With trembling hands, I dialed my friend who was an avid outdoorsman and knew of local legends that might hold some clue to what this creature was. Mark, I whispered into the phone. I need help now. Breathlessly, I described the monstrous creature outside and begged for any advice. 
After a tense pause, he replied softly, It sounds like a scorelock, an old legend about a half-man, half-bear creature that was said to inhabit these woods long ago. He then frantically googled more information about it, and advised me to stay put and hide while he called for help. Despite feeling foolish for believing in such a tale, I took his advice to heart and tucked myself into a small closet under the stairs. The hours dragged on as I listened to the creature prowling around outside. Each shuffling step it took sent jolts of terror through me. In time, barely audible footsteps approached the farmhouse human footsteps. A small knot of hope formed in my stomach. PSSSD. I hissed from within my hiding place. Over here! Crouched outside the closet was an armed deputy, followed by my friend Mark. Relief washed over me as I squeezed out from the cramped space, thanking them for coming to my rescue. What's going on? the deputy asked, urgently scanning the area. I rapidly related the creature's appearance and Mark's identification of it as the scorelock from local legend. The officer seemed skeptical but ready to help. With his firearm at the ready, he cautiously led us through the now quiet clearing, back towards safety. The creature seemed to have retreated back into darkness, leaving us in eerie silence. But as we made our way out of its territory, I couldn't shake the sinking feeling that it hadn't given up on its pursuit. Not yet. We stumbled back to civilization alive but marked with fear. The deputy informed others of what had transpired and urged them to be vigilant in these woods. But only a few believed the tale of the scorelock stalking the shadows among the trees. I shunned the forest after that day and spread word of my harrowing encounter in hopes that people would steer clear of it too. While some laughed at my story and dismissed it as local folklore, those who listened silently pondered whether there was truth in it after all. Mark continued to research the Scorlock legend and discovered that others had encountered something similar over centuries past. The reports grew increasingly more disturbing tales of entire families slaughtered or dragged away never to be seen again. For those who lived near that gloomy forest, life went on as usual almost. Late-night stories around campfires about that dreadful creature fed into their deepest fears while some chose never to venture too close to that dark place again. As years passed, despite no further sign of the scorelock in the area, a tense air hung over the forest, thick with an unspoken dread of what lay beyond its tangled depths. And though some scoffed at the stories and resumed their daily routines, People like me were left scarred and forever vigilant, knowing what horror lurked unseen among the trees. Whether local legend or not, the memory of that nightmarish creature lingers in the minds of all who hear its spine-chilling tale. It reminds us that sometimes in this world, there are unexplained dangers lurking beneath an otherwise ordinary wilderness. I was having a casual conversation with my friend Jim Forkner when it happened. We were discussing our jobs and what life had been like since college. You see, I'm an investigative journalist and our job is really relatable to most people. We investigate actual events and stories on some terrifying ordeals that people face, fact-checking, and collecting evidence. My curiosity had always pushed me to dive deep into the heart of darkness. It was all very real, until I found myself in the middle of one such story, deep in the remote regions of Montana, packed with national forests, the type of place you wouldn't expect anything out of the usual to happen. Once I arrived in Montana, I stumbled upon an abandoned cabin in the woods while investigating a case and decided to stay there for a few days. During my time at the cabin, I quickly noticed unusual scratch marks outside on the window panes. 
These marks seemed as though they had been made by something with large claws. It wasn't long before strange noises echoed through the woods during the night, keeping me awake with fear and anxiety. One evening while walking through the forest, I met a man named Ethan Warrens who seemed as puzzled as I was by these eerie sounds. I thought I was hearing things, he said hesitantly, but it sounds like some sort of creature stalking through those trees. We engaged in conversing about nearby hunting grounds where this mysterious creature might reside. A few days later, after gathering more information from local residents about possible animal attacks in the area over previous weeks, we decided to search for this potential beast that lurked within these woods. Now armed with our hunting rifles and gear, our small group of four embarked on this expedition deep into the heart of darkness. As we ventured further into dense forest thickets that encroached upon our path more and more, each step pounded louder in our ears, echoing through the still air around us. A waiting dread clung to our bones with every stride forward. We first saw a mutilated deer carcass, ripped pieces of flesh strewn across the forest floor, a gruesome sight that seemed like the handiwork of an aggressive predator. It was evident that whatever had done this wasn't an ordinary animal. The deer's entrails were shredded yet arranged in peculiar patterns, as if it were boasting its ghastly work. Our group gradually unearthed more clues, with the tension escalating each time. The quiet murmur of our conversations revealed that we all tried to rationalize these bizarre happenings, but deep down, I sensed it was only escalation. And then it struck. Without warning, a monstrous creature emerged from the shadows, lunging at Jim with blind fury. It was nothing like we had ever seen a massive, hulking beast covered in dark leathery skin and rows of razor-sharp teeth gnashing hungrily. Panicked, I instinctively screamed for help as we scrambled into defensive positions, attempting to fend off this relentless creature from all fronts. It seemed as if every salvo of gunfire or desperate flail of fists only served to enrage it further. Claw marks adorned our arms and legs, but those were merely surface wounds compared to the fearsome snatches and bites dealt by our foe. We tried desperately to repel the beast but found no quarter given by its unyielding rage. Our only hope became clear. Retreat was our last resort. The four of us sprinted away in different directions, desperately seeking refuge within this twisting maze of woods. We strained under primal forces propelling us forward adrenaline-fueled terror clouding senses as we heard the vicious snorting and growling behind us. As we ran, each one of us took a different route, hoping to lose the creature that hunted us. I sprinted towards what looked like an old cabin in the woods, and without thinking twice, I barged in, locking the door behind me. The cabin was small and empty, except for some dusty old books scattered on a shelf. I hoped that the monster wouldn't find me here. Moments later, I heard screams from Jim and Sarah in the distance. I didn't know if it was a terrible idea to call for help. Alerting the creature would be dangerous, but if they were hurt or worse, waiting it out alone felt unbearably cruel. I grabbed my phone and called Mark, who miraculously answered my call between pants and gasps of breath. We agreed to keep our phones open so that we could hear each other while maintaining silence. As I crouched down behind a dusty old bookshelf, I tried to control my frantic breathing. While hiding and listening to Mark's breath on the other end of the line, my eyes caught glimpses of a title on one of the books. Folklore Beasts of Our Region Curiosity momentarily overtook my fear. I grabbed it and began flipping through pages, looking for many drawings or descriptions that vaguely resembled the creature attacking us. There it was, an illustration of a massive beast with dark leathery skin and razor-sharp teeth. As I read further into it, everything started to make sense. 
This creature was called Drachenmeer. Suddenly, there was a loud crash outside the cabin. My heart leapt in my chest as I listened intensely to the dreadful noise marking the approach of our fearsome assailant. Mark fell silent on the other end of the line. His absence filled me with dread as terror continued to grip me tighter. The door rattled once then thrice before bursting open as the drachenmare entered the cabin. It sniffed around the room, heading straight for my hiding spot behind the old bookshelf. Within seconds, it had me cornered. I knew the chances of getting out of this cabin unharmed were close to none. As I stared in horror at the beast that now breathed directly into my face, I felt a pang of anger in remembering the bloodied claw marks on my friend's bodies as they ran from the drachenmare. Summoning all the courage within me, I flung the book at its face with one hand while scrambling away on all fours with limbs aching from exhaustion. The monster recoiled with a snort of irritation, giving me a small window to make my escape. I never stopped running until I reached our car, where Mark was waiting with a look of sheer terror. We got in and started to drive away as fast as possible, leaving behind Jim and Sarah's fate uncertain. The further we got down the road, the more we struggled to push down our guilt about leaving them behind. When we reached town, we went straight to the police station and reported everything we had seen and experienced. Although their skepticism was apparent, they agreed to send a search party for Jim and Sarah regardless. Awaiting any news was perhaps an even greater torment than facing the beast itself. Soon after the search party set out, they returned carrying two bruised and battered bodies. Jim and Sarah were barely alive but miraculously still breathing. Now that all of us were safe, it was time to shed light on what we had faced in those woods. As I shared my discovery of the drachenmare from that old book in the cabin with others investigators took that information and began researching further into this monstrous being from folklore. Even though skeptics within their ranks questioned its reliability and relevance, there was no denying that we needed answers for our harrowing encounters. Weeks later, Jim and Sarah were finally on the mend, and bits of normalcy began to resume in our lives. But even with these gradual improvements, we would forever bear the physical and emotional scars left by that relentless beast in the woods. I remember the day like it was yesterday. A long drive with my friends, we were celebrating a successful project at work. I'm Emmett Snyder, by the way, an IT consultant from Chicago. We decided to take a break from our city life and venture into the remote wilderness of Alaska. We rented a cabin in the outskirts of Fairbanks near the Yukon River, surrounded by dense forests and far away from prying eyes. The breathtaking beauty of the landscape had us all awestruck as we settled into our weekend getaway. We spent our days fishing, hiking, and cracking jokes around the campfire. Our group included myself, Maris Harrington, the company's accountant and amateur chef, Baxter Raymond, who managed client relations and handled marketing, and Janine Frawley, a software developer and nature enthusiast. On the third day of our stay, we stumbled upon something dreadful. While hiking through the woods, Maris noticed a partially buried object that seemed out of place among the leaves and earth. As we carefully excavated it, we discovered a human skull cracked open with dried blood caked around it. A feeling of dread settled over us. The laughter ceased, replaced by hushed whispers as we discussed what to do next. We decided that I'd stay behind to contact local authorities while the others went back to find their way through our cottage's landline since there was no mobile service in these parts. As I stood there alone with that gruesomely disfigured skull, I experienced an eerie sensation. The hairs on my neck stood up straight as if I was being observed by someone. 
or something. An unknown fear gripped me tightly. Suppressing all instincts screaming at me to leave this place behind immediately, I mustered my courage and proceeded towards my friends. Hours later found us huddled inside the cabin waiting for help to arrive. The windows were covered while Baxter nervously held his hunting rifle, ready for any potential threat. Our conversation shifted from shock and horror to lighthearted jokes designed to keep our anxieties at bay. We talked about our past vacations, the time Baxter accidentally caught his fishing line on a turtle or Janine's disastrous attempt at scaling a rock wall. The sun began to set when we heard it, a guttural growl emanating from the dark forest outside the cabin. Baxter tightened his grip on the rifle, and all smiles vanished. Moments later, Heavy breathing matched with the sound of crunching leaves pushed me to override my fear and peer through a crack fast enough just to see an enormous creature approximately nine feet tall, covered in thick fur. Its beastly form moved through the nighttime shadows, a mixture of animalistic and humanoid features that made no sense in this world. Its large arms extended in length with sharp claws slightly distorting under the evening moonlight while its gigantic fangs were exposed beneath unnaturally wide jaw. We were trapped inside the cabin with no place to go as the monster circled our dwelling place, sniffing and tapping its claws on the door frames and windowsills. I whispered to my friends that we needed an escape plan, but no one could think of anything reasonable. The authorities would still be hours out if they even believed our tale. Suddenly, Maris remembered a skylight in one of the bedrooms that led to the roof. We clung together trying our best at remaining stealthy as we cautiously climbed onto what little safety the thin rooftop provided us. With Baxter taking aim at what he hoped was still ground level, we began gathering rope and other materials to fashion makeshift weapons. With the makeshift weapons in hand, we looked down from the rooftop to gauge the possible escape routes. Though calling for help had crossed our minds, we realized it was useless. No one would believe our story unless they saw the creature themselves, and the nearest town was too far away. In those moments, all sound in the cabin below ceased. We held our breath, anxiously waiting for any sign of the creature's next move. Suddenly, it burst through the door with a bone-chilling screech. Its massive form collided against the cabin walls as it tried to get to us. We knew we had no time left. It was now or never. We decided to split up, hoping that at least one of us could reach safety and bring back help. Baxter went first, climbing down a tree toward the edge of the woods. Then Maris followed suit, heading around the back of the cabin toward another escape route. As I turned to make my descent, I heard Baxter scream in terror. I glanced over and saw him being mauled by the creature, blood splattering everywhere. Though my instincts urged me to save him, I knew attempting a rescue would only lead to more death. As I continued my journey into the night, tears streaming down my face knowing what had just transpired behind me was now common knowledge amongst all my fellow peers. Dawn broke as I stumbled towards a nearby town, half delirious from exhaustion and fear. The locals eyed me with weariness, but eventually agreed to accompany me back to our cabin when they saw how desperate I was. Maris had somehow managed her own escape during that terrible night. She emerged from behind a pile of debris in our destroyed cabin close to where we initially encountered that behemoth beast. All evidence of our horrific ordeal was strewn around us including poor Baxter's corpse lying lifeless on the ground, his body brutally mutilated beyond recognition. The sight was unbearable, but we knew we couldn't just leave him there. Gathering our courage, Maris and I tried to give him some semblance of a proper burial. News of our encounter spread throughout the town, and an older local overheard our conversation. 
he approached us looking both fascinated and deeply concerned. I believe I know what you've seen, he said. It resembles the stories I've heard about the Leshy, a creature of folklore known to dwell deep in the woods. He explained further, detailing how its existence had been long debated among historians and cryptozoologists within the town. The man concluded by educating us on the various precautions it was essential to follow when traversing that particular, unsettling area. Despite his revelations, it didn't change anything for Baxter or help erase the gruesome imagery buried deep within our psyche. We could only wish to have known this information sooner. With Baxter buried and our ordeal shared with the town, Maris and I returned home, forever changed and haunted by what we had experienced that terrifying night in the heart of nature's most hidden secrets. We now strive to raise awareness about these grotesque creatures that lurk in humanity's blind spots, so that no one would ever have to face what we went through on that horrifying night. And every time we step into the wilderness or simply hear a growl in the distance, we are reminded of Baxter and how his memory paved the way for the discovery of something truly beyond comprehension. The Leshy I remember the first time I saw that rusted old door. It creaked and moaned as I pushed it open, revealing the darkness behind. My name is Thomas Warren, and I work as an investigator for a small newspaper. I had been sent to a remote town in the Appalachian Mountains to cover a series of bizarre incidents that were whispered among the locals. As I walked through the rickety wooden beams supporting a dilapidated house, I couldn't help but feel the weight of history. The floorboards groaned under each step, seemingly protesting my intrusion. A layer of dust covered everything and an uncomfortable dampness clung to the air. I met with my local contact, Lila McCormick, who informed me about the creature blamed for these strange occurrences in town, unusual animal attacks and inexplicable disappearances. The locals refused to speak its name, simply referring to it as the beast. The dark woods surrounding this once thriving mining town seemed different from the usual forests I've encountered. The trees were closely clustered together, blocking out most light and creating an eerie atmosphere that weighed heavily on my shoulders. Lila spoke lightly about her upbringing in this tight-knit community, but her laughter faded from her lips when she mentioned her concerns for her aging parents' safety living on the outskirts of town. One night, I ventured into the woods armed with a flashlight and an old revolver Lila offered me for protection. The silence was unnerving, only interrupted by distant nocturnal creatures going about their nightly routine without fear of what lurked among them. My heart rate increased with every step deeper into those dark woods, wondering when I would come face to face with this monstrous predator. I don't get paid enough for this. I jokingly muttered under my breath while scanning my surroundings. Chewing on a chocolate bar earlier provided some much-needed humor amidst all of this uncertainty. Then suddenly, a horrifying screech echoed throughout the forest. I raised my revolver with trembling hands. Panic surged through my body as I stared into the abyss of darkness before me. Through the dim glow of my flashlight, I could barely make out a twisted, mangled mass of fur and flesh. Bones protruded unnaturally from its hulking form, which exuded a noxious stench that made bow rise in my throat. Yellowed teeth glinted dangerously in the weak beam curved like daggers stained with blood. The beast lunged at me, its gaping moss snapping inches away from my face before it retreated into the shadows with an inhuman snarl. My body numbed from fear. I didn't even realize I had pulled the trigger of my revolver until the sharp crack echoed throughout the silent woods. Desperately backing away from what was definitely the beast, 
I tripped over a gnarled tree root protruding through the forest floor. As I struggled to regain my footing, a chilling realization overtook me no one knew of my whereabouts in these woods. Lila and her family were too far to hear my cries for help. I clutched on to that age-worn revolver, cursing myself for being too skeptical to take these stories seriously. The beast circled back around towards me while saliva dripped from its grotesque jaw. My heart raced faster than it ever had before. Terror loomed over every part of me, but my senses intensified to adjust to this new reality, one where monsters were both real and hungry. The beast seemed to understand my panic, and likely sensed the desperation in my actions. It charged out of the shadows again, lunging towards me with such speed and aggression that I barely had time to react. My revolver shook in my hand, six bullets were all I had and the beast seemed unaffected by any of them. There was no choice left but to run. I sprinted through the dense forest, my legs pushed beyond their limits as branches whipped at me and the ground threatened to send me sprawling with each misstep. The snarls and growls of the beast grew closer, echoing around me like a chorus of nightmare creatures. I didn't dare to glance back. Then, like a sign from heaven, I spotted Lila's house in the distance, its inviting warm glow cut through the darkness like a beacon. She and her family might help me, maybe even provide sanctuary from this horrific creature. Before I knew it, the beast appeared out of nowhere, right beside me. It moved unnaturally fast, with loping strides that ate up the ground beneath it. Claws raked across my arm as I barely managed to dodge another swipe from its outstretched talons. My mind raced desperately to find a strategy to fend off this monstrous attacker. Abruptly changing direction, I threw myself towards a nearby tree just in time to avoid another lunge from the beast. Grabbing onto low-hanging branch, I heaved myself up into the tree as quickly as my battered body allows. Once adequately hidden among branches and leaves, I allowed myself a moment of respite. What had I stumbled upon? What was this creature? The bees circled my makeshift refuge, sniffing at barks and sometimes clawing at it as well. As night drew on, exhaustion began creeping around my senses like icy tendrils clawing at their prey. I feared if it continued much longer my weakened state would lead to my doom. My grip on the revolver tightened, fingers slick with sweat, or was it blood? It was in that moment of desperation when a new sound emerged, carrying over the beast's menacing growls. Shouting voices, recognizably human. A spark of hope ignited within me, and I couldn't help but wonder if it was Lila and her family who had heard the commotion. Barely able to maintain a tight hold on the branches, I caught glimpse of them approaching with torches in hand. They shouted at the beast, hurling rocks and logs to deter it from coming closer. I let out an involuntary sigh of relief when it backed away from their determined advance. As brave as they were in facing the beast, however, they all kept a safe distance from me as I limped toward them. The experience seemed to have altered their perception of me, a stranger brought into their lives who'd unearthed horrors better left forgotten. Four days following the encounter, we barely spoke, each of us grappling with the implications of what had transpired. Days turned into weeks, as life began to regain some semblance of normalcy, but the dreamlike recollection remained ever vivid within me. It wasn't until weeks later when I met with an old man in town that things began to truly unravel. A former scholar and expert on folklore legends sat down with me over some hastily scribbled notes, jotted down on tattered pieces of paper that described something uncannily like my terrifying adversary. The old man is adamant. I'd encountered Chupacabra, a dreaded menace whispered about around fires late at night across generations. 
lives would forever be haunted by their encounter with this voracious predator that had walked straight out of folklore. As shadows lengthen once more, my nights remain guarded by more than just locked doors and my faithful revolver close at hand. The nightmare that had so briefly shattered the tranquility of these woods was now a matter of reality. And survivors of its horrific attacks remain, some now bearing the weight of more than just lost loved ones, but the burden of knowledge that even legends can come to life. The fear continues to gnaw at me. Would Chupacabra ever return? I was feeling uneasy that day. My partner, Valerie Adams, and I were driving towards the small town of Pickenville, located in the backwoods of Mississippi. We'd been called there as a part of an investigation. My name is Otis Klein, by the way. As we entered the town, I noticed how eerily quiet it was. The only sounds were those of our footsteps and the rustling of leaves. Suddenly we heard a scream pierce through the stillness. We hurried towards the cry for help and found a local woman, Dinah Harrelson, panicking next to her injured husband. His leg was mangled beyond recognition and large claw marks covered his body. He was alive, but barely. Dinah didn't know what caused this horrific scene. Valerie and I decided to search for any clues nearby when we stumbled across unfamiliar tracks, not like anything we'd ever seen. The creature had left behind an overwhelming stench that made us both feel nauseous. Despite my initial skepticism, as we followed the tracks into the woods, I couldn't help but feel that we were being watched by something sinister, something inhuman. The twilight darkened as we ventured deeper into the forest. I couldn't shake off the sensation that something was stalking us and only held back because it knew we were armed. Hoping to find some answers at last, we reached what looked like an abandoned cabin in a clearing. The dank smell of decay was palpable even from a distance. Someone must have sought refuge inside yet met with a gruesome fate. We cautiously made our way inside the decaying structure when Valerie spoke up. Hey, Otis, do you think this is where our perpetrator lives? She asked with a nervous gulp. Not sure, but let's find out, I replied. Searching through the ruins, we discovered books filled with strange symbols and horrifying illustrations dedicated to grotesque, animalistic creatures. As we continued our investigation, we found ourselves backtracking and trying to retrace our steps. What was it that caused all the carnage we'd discovered so far? And why had no one raised a fuss about this mysterious creature's existence? Getting jumpy, Valerie asked. Hey, Otis. How many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? The tension eased with my bewildered look before she said, Ten tickles! We both laughed briefly, but our laughter was cut short by a guttural growl behind us. Slowly turning around, we locked eyes with the most horrifying being I had ever seen, a monstrous, seven-foot-tall beast with blood-red eyes. This monstrosity was covered in black fur, and its claws were dripping in fresh blood. Its grotesque features were unlike any creature I had ever witnessed and my mind struggled to comprehend its true nature. I raised my gun to fire but hesitated as another guttural growl echoed through the woods. Suddenly aware of the creatures surrounding us from every angle, more of these abominations that moved with unnatural speed, I realized what we were up against. We found ourselves cornered and surrounded by these unearthly predators. Our weapons were useless as they only increased in number, forcing us further into the darkness of the forest where their terrifying presence loomed ever closer. Pushed deeper into the forest, Valerie and I tried to find a way to escape the encircling beasts. We couldn't call for help. Our phones had no signal in the dense woods. Desperate, 
we decided to climb a tree as high as we could to at least gain temporary safety from these creatures. Perched on a sturdy branch, we observed the monsters prowling below. Their movements were unnerving, a combination of animalistic hunger and intelligent stalking. We held our breaths, praying that they wouldn't notice us. It wasn't until the next day that an opportunity arose for escape. These creatures seemed to retreat with the rising sun. However, we didn't have much time before darkness returned and the beasts with it. Without hesitating, we descended to the ground and found our bearings. As we started running through the woods, my ankle snared in a bear trap, left, no doubt, by some unwitting hunter who had no idea about horrors that lurked here. Pain exploded through my leg. Blood oozed from the wound as I struggled to free myself. Panicking, Valerie rushed over and tried her best to prize open the jaws of the trap. Finally managing it, she said, We have no other choice but to try to make it back to town. It's our only chance. Limping painfully beside her for support, daylight threatened to slip away from us. With the encroaching darkness came ominous growls echoing through the trees once again. Then, as if from nowhere, an old man stepped onto our path, clad in tattered clothes and wielding an old hunting rifle. Quick! Follow me! he shouted without explanation. Trusting him solely because he was human and not one of those dreaded beasts, we trailed him through the serpentine forest pathways. Well? I asked as we navigated cautiously through shadows of twilight. Who are you? How do you know all this? And what are those creatures? The man introduced himself as Roger, a local hunter, who had been tracking these beasts for years. He proceeded to tell us what they were, creatures of a local legend called Snarl Demons. According to him, they were goats that once wandered these woods, mutated by an ungodly curse into carnivorous monsters. Roger outlined how he had been observing and meticulously noting their patterns and figured out places where they dared not tread so that others may be spared our fate. The hunter led the way without stopping trapping us in the tight embrace of his shadows. Before any of us could think of ado, we suddenly found ourselves standing at the edge of town. We had made it back in time to see a sliver of sunlight linger above the horizon. Thank you, Valerie uttered with immense relief. Taking some parting shots with his rifle at distant rustling bushes, Roger replied, Remember my warning. Don't go near those woods ever again. Then he disappeared back amongst the trees. Valerie looked at me, her eyes filled with gratitude for our savior and terror for what she knew now lurked just beyond sight. As much as I wanted to forget this horrifying experience, I knew I couldn't just wash my hands of it. We decided to share our ordeal with the townspeople. Maybe they'll understand the reason behind their missing loved ones. We worked together with the villagers to create a well-marked barrier around these cursed woods hoping that both humans and snarl demons could live in harmony without ever crossing paths. In the weeks following our escape and telling our story, I'd often find myself staring at the dark boundary of those woods, feeling both shaken and alive by the close scrape with an awful fate only spoken about in whispers and legends. As it turned out, some nightmares were more than mere whispers in the dark. We'd managed to escape ours, but we couldn't ever afford to forget.